so welcome to the third make in india conference hosted by impact media and events corporation uh, we have so far done two such conferences this year first one was on travel tourism and hospitality in march and the second was on it and manufacturing in october today's events uh, theme is infrastructure uh, the purpose of this canada india bilateral conference is is to bring the various stakeholders in these sectors together whether it is the political leaders policy makers private and institutional investors prominent business leaders and others we are now also following up on this virtual events with in person round tables to take the ideas exchange forward and make things happen on the ground apart from this make in india conferences we also host annual gala events with a major india 75 gala com- coming up in may 2022 canada india education forum provincial and inter provincial conferences and several other activities infrastructure is key to a nation's survival and growth whether it is roads bridges highways smart cities power generation and distribution schools hospitals railways airports pipelines utilities or industrial parks each sub sector offers tremendous opportunities for job growth and multiple other direct and indirect benefits canadian technology and know how has always played an important role globally and the canadian companies as well as many institutional investors including large pension funds from canada are actively engaged and invested in india's infrastructure and other sectors at a time like this when all countries are struggling to go back to pre pandemic normal um this is the right time to discuss how canada and india can work together in this vital sector for mutual benefit especially when the government of india has just announced a major push for infrastructure with a national infrastructure plan called gati shakti worth 110 lakh rupees or almost 2 trillion dollars We have a stellar lineup of speakers and organizations who will share very valuable insights and experiences with us today. Before we begin, let me thank uh, our sponsors today uh, who support these events: Efficient Canada, Skylink Capital Corp, Pavi Bidding, ICICI Bank Canada, SBI Canada Bank, One Place, Akal Insurance, Home Hotel and Resort. um a special thank you to our presenting sponsor for 2022 tangentia and especially to the high commission of india whose support and guidance has made all this uh, possible and to nagasarat pandurangi for uh, always being there for us uh, as a strong tech uh, backup uh with that please join me to welcome the acting high commissioner of india to canada his excellency sanshman gore to deliver the welcome remarks I believe uh, he will also be making a PowerPoint presentation. So before that, let us take a quick look at the ASC's profile. Um, Sanjuan Gaur joined the Indian Foreign Service in 2001. He has since served in various capacities in the Indian embassies at Paris and Nepal, and with the permanent delegation of India to UNESCO Paris. At the headquarters, he served on Bhutan desk as officer on special duty. in the external publicity division and as a director looking after western european affairs mr gore also served as officer on special duty to the vice president of india and as a private secretary to the law minister of india he speaks english hindi and french he is married to ms apurva shivastava presently the consul general of india in toronto they have two daughters so over to you sir uh thank you vipul ji uh, thank you for that uh, very generous introduction and uh, welcome to to all our panelists uh, mr wallace uh mr campbell uh people joining us from from india uh, i believe uh, we will also have uh, shortly the minister from alberta uh joining us if he is not already uh, connected with us uh, uh again it's always a pleasure to uh, to join 
uh, Vipul Jani and uh, his team at IMEC for uh, the wonderful sessions that we have had in the past on Make in India. And today to talk about infrastructure uh, is something we certainly look forward to. Uh, about 12 years ago, when I was working as a, as a commercial counselor in, in Paris, I would begin my presentations on India with, do you have an exit policy for India? Uh, the subtext being that if you had not had an entry policy for India by 2011, you are already too late. I won't be wasting my time with you. Uh, India is that important to economy. It continues to be uh, important to economy because it's one of the few places which, will, which is registering growth and will continue to register growth in all sectors uh, for many years to come. Today, it is the fastest economy, uh, fastest growing economy in the world. The structural changes which we have made in India over the past six years, uh, significantly in the last uh, uh, few months under the Atmanirbhar Bharat vision of the Prime Minister or the Resilient India uh, vision, which posits India as an alternative to the fragile single point uh, supply chains that we have seen in the uh, in the world and the impact of uh, pandemic on them. Uh, in in the bounce back, uh, India has surprised many people. Although not many of us who who knew that our fundamentals will power us to uh, you know the kind of recovery we are seeing today. Uh, our uh, domestic equity market uh, remains excessively uh, buoyant. Uh, it's an indication that both global and domestic uh, uh, players have confidence uh, in the Indian market. Uh, we just saw a threefold increase in DMAT accounts in India. That shows the, the confidence which domestic inv investors, retail investors now have in the, in the market. Uh, I think the, the highest uh, FPI inflow was in September this year, almost $3 billion. Uh, and it was the largest in all the emerging market economies. Uh, we have, in this fiscal so far, we have reported more than 8 billion uh, FPI uh, inflows. Uh, and similar to the case when we look at FDI, about $82 billion of FDI inflow already this year. Uh, private uh, equity and venture capital investment have risen to their highest level ever. Uh, in the last decade to over 62, uh, $63 billion, uh, that was last year. And the sectors which uh, have attracted these investments have largely been uh, infrastructure, real estate, technology, healthcare, and uh, financial services. Uh, as Vipulji said, infrastructure is key to growth in India. We are very cognizant of that. Uh, the government has made a conscious effort uh, to promote and strengthen this sector with massive outlays. We expect our infrastructure sector to be worth more than uh, $4.5 trillion by 2040. Uh, some of the, I won't talk about uh, in great detail about the, the schemes and various uh, opportunities that the government has created. Uh, we will talk, touch them in passing. I'll focus on three specific sectors. Uh, but you you have heard that uh, uh, about the national in infrastructure pipeline uh, with an investment of uh, 1.4 trillion dollars uh, up to 2025. Uh, of this, 25 percent or uh, sorry, 21 percent is expected to come from private uh, uh, equity uh, to further you know give uh, impetus to to private investment. Uh, a new class of uh, assets uh, uh, by monetization, monetization of existing operational and revenue generation assets has been created. Uh, several asset classes have been identified, everything from transmission lines to uh, gas pipeline, uh, to logistic parks, to raise money for uh, new greenfield uh, 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 sectors. Uh, in conjugation, a massive expansion of India's <laughs> transportation sector, both in uh, civil aviation and in road infrastructure creates tremendous opportunities uh, for uh, investment. Uh, this is being monitored at the highest level in India. Vipulji mentioned about the PM Gati Shakti uh, program, which basically incorporates all infrastructure schemes from various ministries and the state governments. 
uh, under a single uh, umbrella and uh, for better management and uh, uh, supervision of the thing. Uh, Canadian investors have been uh, far ahead of the, the global investment uh, investor pack in going to India. Uh, we have seen a massive increase in portfolio investment from Canada. All the private sector and uh, pension funds are represented in India today. Uh, the total holding of over $55 billion now. Uh, they have in their conversation with us reflected a continued positive outlook towards uh, Indian uh, market. Uh, we have worked with uh, our Canadian investors in some specific areas uh, and addressed some of the issues which they have flagged to us. Uh, some of the changes which have been made in the last two budgets have been specifically uh, at the instance of our Canadian investors to provide them with uh, uh, you know, a better level, level playing field. Uh, some of these have included things like abolishment of the dividend distribution tax, uh, increase in the foreign portfolio investment limit, uh, general lower, lowering of the corporate taxes. Uh, we provide 100% tax exemption to pension funds investing in, in, uh, in infrastructure, uh, which was earlier only available to sovereign wealth funds. Uh, they are also allowed to make investment through holding companies subject to certain conditions. Uh, and several other uh, measures have been put in place to encourage uh, private equity and especially investment from pension uh, funds into, into India. Uh, mm -hmm. Brookfield is now the largest foreign uh, equity holder in India. Most of the Canadian funds are represented there. Uh, three specific areas I quickly want to touch about that I think are going to be specifically uh, of great interest to Canadian investors. One is, of course, the launch of the Real Estate uh, Investment Trust and the Infrastructure Investment Trust, uh, REITs and INVITs. Uh, both SEBI and RBI have recently taken steps to make them more attractive uh, for investment. Uh, the other class of investment where I think uh, Canadian uh, investors would be very interested in is uh, uh, property or real estate tech. Uh, we have seen a range of startups come up in India in the last two years. Uh, you know, COVID kind of accelerated the technology input into construction, real estate, and infrastructure development. Companies like Traxon, Yoja, SmartBizX, uh, and Infra.Market have raised tremendous amount of equity. And this is going to be a sector which is going to continue to attract uh, more investment, uh, especially equity investment. The third area of particular interest to Canadian investors would be the clean energy sector in India. We have set a very ambitious target for ourselves of uh, 450 gigawatts uh, likely to go up in the next few years. And that represents a tremendous area of investment and collaboration uh, to Canadian uh, investors as two major democracies which, are, which have expect, accepted the reality of climate change uh, and are committed to addressing it globally, also through domet domestic action. I think uh, collaboration in, in green energy and clean energy sector is a, is a fairly uh, given uh, cause. India looks at Canada as a, as a natural partner. Our uh, long shared traditional uh, relationship is based on shared values of uh, rule of law, democratic principle, plurality and multiculturalism. Uh, we also have a huge uh, Indian, Indian community in Canada, almost 1.8 million strong now, who act as the bridgehead for several of the commercial ventures and who continue to be the cornerstone of our bilateral relationship. Uh, the trade between India and Canada has grown. Uh, we have restarted our negotiations for a comprehensive economic partnership and a bilateral investment promotion agreement. Uh, which I think both will encourage more investment both ways from uh, between the two countries. Uh, so without taking much time, I uh, can promise you that uh, the High Commission in Ottawa and our two posts in Vancouver and Toronto remain at your service. Uh, if you're looking at investment opportunity, if you're looking to connect with networks in India, if you're looking for resources, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. And uh, I again welcome all of you uh, this morning to this uh, very interesting conversation uh, and wish you very happy deliberations. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir, for very precise and uh, useful uh, information that you provided. Um, so we uh, we would request you to stay with us uh, while we uh, invite some other speakers. Um, so we will now go to uh, Sir Rahul Agarwal, Invest India, um, and that will be followed by uh, Mr. Prasad Panda uh, and uh, Glenn Campbell, and then we will have a brief first Q and A. Uh, with the first four speakers uh, before we go to the next uh, round of uh, speakers. So, uh, Mr. Rahul Agarwal, our next uh, speaker, uh, he is the Vice President for uh, Invest India. Uh, Rahul has over a decade of experience in uh, infrastructure financing policy and corporate strategy. At Invest India, Rahul leads the teams for real estate, infrastructure, and financial investors uh, initiative which attracts SWFs, pension funds, and PF and PE investments. Rahul has been instrumental in India's first asset recycling project, which saw investments of $1.5 billion and has been working with government and private entities across sectors to introduce new investment opportunities in the country. Rahul has also worked as a consultant for high-level committee on financing infrastructure, planning commission, government of India. He was instrumental in developing infrastructure section of the 12th five-year plan of the country and updating model concessional agreements for PPP. Rahul started his career with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, as an institutional derivatives analyst. And he holds an MBA in finance and also a certified financial risk manager and is a chartered financial analyst. About uh, Invest India, uh, Invest India is the National Investment Promotion and Facilitation Agency set up under the aegis of the Department for Promotion and, uh, of Industry and Internal Trade, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. Invest India focuses on sector-specific investor targeting and development of new partnerships to enable sustainable investments in India. Uh, and they also work actively with several Indian states. So over to you, uh, Rahul. Thank you so much, uh, Vipulji. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, for inviting, uh, you know, organizing this uh, amazing conference and inviting uh, Invest India uh, uh, to share its views uh, 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 on, on this topic. Uh, you know, I think you know, we are talking about uh, infrastructure today, which, you know, I feel is a, you know, is an opportune topic with what's happening. But before I really jump into infrastructure, I would like to talk about a bit about India. Right, I think uh, you know uh, His Excellency the uh, Ambassador touched uh, you know very nicely on how India bounced back uh, very strongly from COVID, and you know, one of the strongest reasons behind that is you know these five uh, pillars, the fundamental pillars of Indian economy. Uh, you know where I call you know I, you know I have a personal bias against you, right? But young workforce, uh, the booming consumer market, you know these two areas actually collaborate really well and has, you know, is the one of the biggest reasons why India could come back. You know, just to share a very interesting number, in the November 2021, this month, the last month which we saw, we saw about $7 billion uh, worth of uh, private equity and venture capital money uh, moving into Indian startups. You know, so, you know, if, I, if you really, you know, if, uh, I'm a numbers person. So if you really just multiply, you know, you're looking at about $100 billion of institutional capital moving into the private, you know, on the private side with startups, with businesses, which are, you know, yet to get listed. So that's, you know, that's the power of Indian economy. And then, you know, the largest democracy on the planet, you, you know, we've continuously showed over years that, you know, how, you know, a country such as large as India, uh, you know, uh, elects, you know, various governments and the, the development agenda uh, remains the same. So that's, you know, one of the very, very beautiful part about India. COVID has shown that, you know, we can bounce back very fast and we are headed uh, towards 10% growth and we will be, you know, we are and we will remain the fastest growing, uh, fastest growing economy uh, on the planet. Uh, moving from there, you know, I think uh, I mentioned about markets. India, in fact, is one of the top markets across various segments. You look at smartphones, uh, you know, we are the highest consumer of data in the world uh, on the smartphone per se as well. We are already the second largest uh, smartphone market in the world. Uh, we are among the second largest steel producers, 
uh, among you know one of the largest uh, uh, cargos uh, you know as well uh, you know one very interesting number i want to show on this slide uh, is the aviation market you know it's probably not the best time to talk about it because covid you know that got really disrupted but for almost a decade uh, uh, just till the pre covid period we almost grew uh, in access of about 20% uh and you know became you know we at, at about you know 340 million domestic market only and this number is just growing you know i think you know i think once we settle down from covid uh we are looking for uh for this growth from here to just continue uh and and you know markets uh, remain like that this is very very interesting you know i would want all of you to you know spend just 30 seconds with me on this slide uh bloomberg did a nation brand tracker uh, uh, survey in 2018 uh where you know and and especially for this region where uh, we are uh, uh in east and south asia uh and on you know various parameters which included the political stability the currency stability corruption cost of production uh, for products strategic location etc and on all of these 10 parameters they found india to be number 1 on seven of these parameters in this region uh where we were not the best was infrastructure uh tax privileges we were just there in quality of living investors we were number 3 so you know i think if you really put these two together i think infrastructure and quality of living for investors uh that's where you know you know that's what we are talking about today and that's government's plan uh now to take you know from there to you know again uh get the higher ranks uh, for infrastructure as well in the infrastructure story if i really talk about it uh, you know uh, broadly in you know how i see the modern infrastructure story for india uh starting in uh, late 90s when we first introduced the ppps uh mm -hmm. in india uh you know that story was very very interesting we started working on institutional mechanisms uh model concession agreements you know model documents on how we execute our ppps and every detail around it whether it's the guarantee structure or banks being prepared for lending to ppps in india or the workforce which you require uh to conduct and manage those ppps we created all of that uh, in in last two decades and that is why you know the the, the first uh, row on this thing is you know talks about the operational maturity of ppps in india is very very high adp the asian development bank ranked us number one on that and they also said that we have a very comprehensive institutional framework for private investments in infrastructure that also shows you know why we have over 300 billion dollars worth of ppp projects over 1800 projects which is which is unforeseen anywhere else in the world and from there you know now we are moving towards you know what we call our national infrastructure pipeline where we plan to invest 1.4 trillion dollars in in infrastructure uh you know broadly on, on in gdp terms it will be about 8 to 9% of indian gdp and to expand it uh, from there uh to make it possible we have launched the national monetization plan uh his excellency the ambassador talked about it and the national infrastructure bank as well i think you i think all of you back in canada you know you have launched the canadian uh, infrastructure bank on a similar lines we've launched the national infrastructure bank here as well to aid the growth uh, of this 1.4 trillion dollars which i'm talking about what is our strategy i think uh, you know and and what's you know what's really changing in indian infrastructure i think i'm sure you know even in canada you might have heard that you know a lot of fragmented infrastructure development has happened in india we, we've got good roads you know sometimes we had those connectivity issues to ports or maybe railway lines uh our plan and, and specifically the the national master plan the pm gati shakti talks about integrating all of these infrastructure in a seamless manner so that you know if i'm moving a cargo uh from a metro city say delhi uh putting it in a truck first and then in a railway line and then to the port everything is very very seamless so it's today we talk about integration of our infra, all of of all our infrastructure sub sectors in in a seamless manner the next thing which we have been doing over last 5 years is to make infrastructure investable uh if you really go back a few years it was you know very very difficult to invest in indian infrastructure uh we started amending you know clauses where we allowed that you know exits for developers were possible and investors like pension funds and private equity infrastructure funds could invest so we made that possible we later introduced reits and invits in the market and and that is what we were talking about new models is a very very interesting aspect uh, we've created opportunities for investors to do that uh, you know there's a beautiful example uh, uh, where uh, uh, mr prasad gadkari will talk about you know the nif which in itself is a huge uh, opportunity for global investors if they want to enter market you know that talks about that and new avenues you know i think you go back 7 8 years 
uh, Indian infrastructure would be limited to energy and roads. Today we can talk about, you know, we can talk about uh, water supply. We can talk about oil and oil and gas pipelines, airports. You know, that list is just expanding. You know, I'm sure you would not have heard, but today there is a massive expansion going on for city gas distribution as well, and massive infrastructure is being created for that. So new avenues have constantly been created in India, which you know gives opportunities for investors to participate. Uh, specifically about national infrastructure pipeline, I'll not take too much time. It has been covered. Uh, it's the vision 2025. We're going to invest 1.4 trillion dollars. It specifically talks about expanding the infrastructure availability. You know, just to take uh, the example of roads. You know, we are going to add almost 67,000 kilometers of national highways in India. I'll I'll tell you what is national highways on my next slide. Similarly, on energy front or the airport, we're going to double or maybe you know quadruple from what, where we exist today. Uh, uh, the High Commissioner mentioned about 21% private participation. If you really total that up, it's almost $350 billion of private capital, which we are trying to, which we are planning to attract to Indian infrastructure sector. Now, this is, you know, uh, you know, when we talk about Indian infrastructure, we cannot ignore roads. Uh, and national highways is, you know, is the core of. Uh, or, or I should say the core of uh, the entire highway network uh, in the country. Um, I just want you to focus on this map. And I just, and you know, if you really see, you know, there are a few lines, which is our core infrastructure. How we define this is the, you know, there's a north-south, uh, there's an east-west uh, line, and there is one line, which, the, which we call is the golden quadrilateral. We are actually moving away from this strategy to what I show you in this one, right? So, you know, it's not going to be only core infrastructure, but a grid-like structure, because traffic in India is increasing. And, and, and we need to provide them infrastructure availability closest to their, you know, to every uh, destination possible in India. And that's what uh, we, were, we are trying to do. Uh, uh, we are going to be about 200,000 kilometers in next five years. Uh, you know, a few numbers for you to, to see, as in obviously, you know, this talks about the construction opportunity which exists today. Uh, and most of it is uh, going to be, you know, on PPPs. Uh, and you know some numbers are on right. You know we have about 32,000 kilometers of PPP roads which already uh, exist. Uh, about 51 billion dollars worth of 161 projects uh, are under construction, and we have about 102 operational PPP projects as well in the country. Now you know this is more about uh, the opportunity which is available for construction companies. But I understand there are a lot of investors in Canada. So we have, what we have created is the asset recycling program. Uh, for investors, uh, you know, you know, uh, long-term investors like pension funds, uh, you know, we created this about five years back. What we call is the toll operate transfer model. What we do here is the constructed asset which we have, uh, we we uh, lease it out. Uh, essentially, you know, I want to use the word lease loosely uh, uh, for about thirty years at against an upfront payment, uh, and the toll right accord along with the operation and maintenance right uh, goes to the investor for thirty years. Uh, we've now done about five of these bundles. We call them bundle because we don't give one road. We try and make the, the asset size a little larger, you know, closer to about a billion dollar. And, you know, investors can come, uh, invest in this, uh, you know, so we have, they have to essentially bid, the, bid for the asset and then operate and maintain the road and collect tolls for 30 years. The first one there, you know, Macquarie actually won it for about a billion and a half. So we had the base price of about a billion and Macquarie bid that. Uh, so this is this was the model, you know, which I, you know, which I got to work for, and you know, has successfully we've been successfully able to expand, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, you know, investments uh, in this particular piece. Uh, quickly, you know, I, I mentioned most of the things here, but you know, upfront lump sum payment is what investors have to give. They get about thirty years tolling right. They have the obligation of ONM and toll collection. Uh, it's transparent, open, and competitive. So you have to come, and you know, you can see, uh, you know, what's really happening. Uh, large projects. Change in ownership is allowed. So if you want to, you know, you buy the asset today and you want to flip it over to somebody else, that's absolutely allowed. Uh, there's a very, very interesting element there. You know, if at the 10th and the 20th year, you know, if there is a traffic variation, uh, you know, if you you estimated something else but that did not really realize, there is a uh, there's a clause that you can actually extend uh, the concession agreement uh, based on a predetermined formula. So that gives you a comfort if there are any shortages in the traffic. Obviously, on the other end, if there are excess traffic, there is a slight or I should say, 50% reduction uh, compared to the to the to the increase in uh, toll there, and essentially we've kept termination payments in a manner that political risk does not exist. At the time. Quickly moving to renewable energy, I think this is uh, one of the most uh, you know looked after you know people uh, look people look forward to this sector a lot. Uh, 
Uh, India has done uh, exceptionally well uh, on renewable front. Today, we have about 100 gigawatt of installed capacity and about 75 gigawatt of uh, capacity is under implementation as uh, I am speaking. Um, India has a huge potential for solar, about 749 gigawatt uh, worth of potential exists for solar sector uh, in India. And then, uh, you know, followed by wind and other means. Uh, what we have noted uh, in this sector is that uh, investors from uh, across the world, you know, the Middle Eastern investors, Asian, as well as, uh, you know, North America, including Canada, have uh, invested heavily in the renewable sector. Uh, you know, India has uh, committed to net zero uh, as well in COP26. Uh, and, uh, you know, that talks about, you know, how we are going to move uh, from current 100 gigawatt of renewable to 450 gigawatt by 2020, 2030, and most likely, uh, you know, I, I think I can um, for sure commit that we will exceed that target uh, easily. Railways is very interesting. Uh, we have about 8.2 billion passengers traveling, uh, you know, through Indian railways every year. That's about, that's world's population. Uh, we've done exceptionally well uh, in last five years. You know, I, you know, I'm sure you would have at some point heard uh, about accidents on Indian railways. Uh, the year before last, I should not talk about the COVID year, the, the year just before COVID, we did not see a single COVID, uh, single passenger death. Uh, so the kind of infrastructure improvements we've done uh, has been, has been, has really rewarded us. Uh, now the focus is on expanding to modern infrastructure. Uh, we are adding dedicated, what we call is the dedicated freight corridors to move the freight much faster. Uh, if you see these lines, the blue one and the green one connecting, uh, connecting Delhi to JNPT, which is the Mumbai port, and uh, uh, Ludhiana, which is again north of Delhi, to Dankuni, which is uh, next to the Calcutta port, the Kolkata port, uh, are already in the advanced stages of construction. We will be able to move, so just to give you some sense on that, we'll be able to move a container from Delhi to Mumbai in about 16 hours and to Calcutta in about 24 hours, uh, which will be reducing the current uh, time which a truck, ta truck takes uh, to by almost 66%. So that's the efficiency we are looking forward to by adding that. In addition to that, we are implementing the high-speed railways and we are uh, only going for multiple projects therein. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you know you would have imagined you know, the population of 1.4 billion and railway passengers, which is 8.2 billion. The railway stations have a huge, uh, huge, huge opportunity, uh, probably much bigger than airports. Uh, and we are trying to build our railway stations like airports. So, you know, I very strongly recommend you to imagine, you know, uh, you know what a railway station can do. If, you know, if airports can make money globally, railway stations in India can make probably 5x of that because of the footfall which we see there. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I think railway again is uh, going for a net zero uh, uh, by 2030. There is a 100% there's a electrification uh, project which is going on, which we plan to deliver by 2023. Airports, I mentioned about it. I, I told you about the, the, the passenger growth. Uh, we are talking about uh, almost 200 airports by FI40. Uh, and, you know, this opportunity, you know, I think in India, we, you know, everyone wants to travel, use, use the aircraft, you know, they want to travel uh, using the aeroplanes. And that is the reason why we have seen the kind of growth uh, for domestic passengers as well as international. Uh, airports, you know, what we are, what we are doing uh, of late is privatizing the existing airports, uh, and six of these airports have already been privatized. We have planned to privatize another thirteen. Uh, essentially, how we do it is uh, the you know we invite uh, global investors to come uh, and uh, and offer uh, the best, the highest uh, passenger fee uh, per uh, per passenger fee, uh, which you know, and you can take that airport operated for long term. Uh, and develop infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, as you believe uh, fits the best for that airport. Uh, and, you know, there, you know, from there, I bring you to national monetization pipeline. So, you know, initially I was talking about the infrastructure pipeline, which is more about constructing, but to fund the construction, we, we are also doing monetization pipeline. I'm sure, you know, many of you understand, you know, what Australia went through when they did their asset, uh, entire asset recycling uh, model. It's pretty similar to that. Uh, we have assets worth 81 billion, which have been recognized, which have been, uh, which have been found to to monetize over next uh, three to four years. Essentially, it's going to be a long-term concession-like uh, model, the way I mentioned TOT. Uh, and we have about 20 asset classes across 20, 12 sectors. So you know, uh, things like dedicated freight corridors, oil and gas pipelines, all are part of uh, uh, part of part of the national monetization pipeline. 
Uh, quickly on this, private equity investments in India have been on a high. Uh, I think you know I'm, I'm missing 20, the year 2021 on this slide, but from about 10 billion in 2008, uh, we got about 60 billion uh, in 2020, 2021. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that 2022 should be about 100 billion dollars uh, easily for uh, private equity investments in India, uh, which tells you that smart money is actually coming to India. Uh, it's about you know time that you you come to India and uh, read these games. Uh, LPs, I think this is uh, you know I'm sure uh, many of you you know are aware that you know some of the largest uh, funds in India have deployed uh, uh, money and and many of them come from Canada. Uh, and they've taken bets, you know, right from infrastructure to real estate, and and now how I say, you know, they've started taking opportunistic bets as well. You know, you you look at CPPIB, they've uh, they've started investing in startups as well in India. So that tells you the the entire story on how investors see it. You know, one thing which I want to add here is that you know India's pension fund itself is growing by thirty percent, uh, and you know, in in about ten years from here, you know, and we stand at about uh, about hundred billion today. So I think you know all of you can do the numbers. I think in very few, in few years, our, that fund will become large. So the opportunity to actually enter India is, you know, is probably six to seven years at the max. So use this opportunity. It's, it's really big one uh, as of now. Uh, and then, you know, the competition uh, is going to increase. And this is us, Invest India, the National Investment Promotion Agency. Uh, uh, we are set, we were set up by Government of India to facilitate investors to help them and handhold them as uh, in their interest. Mm -hmm. So uh, I look forward to work uh, with all of you, answer any of your questions here today or, or later if you want to connect with uh, me or my team, which is there on this, uh, on this forum as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rauji, for a fantastic presentation. There was a lot of details um, in those uh, 20 minutes, um, you know, but we'll be happy to share the presentation with, uh, with anyone, uh, you know, who wants it. Um, especially with the speakers for sure. Um, so thank you once again, and uh, please stay back with us, as I mentioned. So we'll now move to our next uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Prasad Panda. Um, Mr. Panda um, was first, he is the Minister of Infrastructure, Government of Alberta. Um, he was first elected to the Legislative Assembly of Alberta in a by-election in September 2015 as MLA for Calgary Foothills, and then re-elected in April 2019 as an MLA for the newly formed riding of Calgary Edgemont. Born in Sangam Jagarla Mudi, Andhra Pradesh, India, Mr. Panda has lived in the constituency of Calgary Edgemont for 15 years. A professional engineer by trade, uh, he holds a Bachelor of Technology in Mechanical Engineering and worked in the energy sector for 28 years including in senior management positions with Reliance Industries Limited, as well as uh, Suncor Energy. Mr. Panda was a key member of the project management teams that has built projects worth over $100 billion, including petroleum, petrochemicals, power, pipelines, and marine infrastructure, and oil sands development projects. During the last uh, legislature, Mr. Panda was a member of the Legislative Standing Committee on public accounts, resource stewardship, and Alberta's economic future. And he served um, as the official opposition critic for energy and economic development and trade. And uh, he is currently Alberta's uh, infrastructure minister, as I mentioned earlier. So over to you, Mr. Panda. Namaste. Can you hear me, Vipulji? Yes, absolutely, sir. Go ahead. Excellent. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to all of those uh, who joined uh, from uh, different time zones. Uh, here in Alberta, the sun didn't raise that, and we are at minus 30 degrees. But, uh, you know, my heart warms out when uh, Vipulji uh, asked me to come and join uh, with the, on a seminar with Indian uh, um, uh, officials. Uh, so great to see uh, His Excellency uh, Anshmanji. Uh, and I, I want to give a shout out to, to him and his colleagues, uh, uh, Ajay Baisarya ji, and in our area, uh, Manish ji, they're all doing a great uh, job. 
in uh, Anshmanji and his uh, wife and everyone is doing great job in advancing the uh, the uh, economic and cultural ties between uh, two great democracies, uh, Canada and India, um, and also people like Vipulji and Tejas and everyone working hard to deepen and strengthen those ties. Uh, as a as a Indo Canadian, I'm always uh, uh, interested and uh, look forward to participate in these kind of discussions as a Minister of Infrastructure. On behalf of the government of Alberta, it's my honor uh, to to be with you today. So I, I I may be doing injustice to my officials and staff because I skip their notes every time I go talk about India because I don't need any notes. So I I know what's happening there. So I lived there long enough, and I still have family back home. So I'm still in touch with uh, many of my former colleagues and uh, everyone. So. Uh, but I'm quite impressed uh, what uh, Rahul presented just now. So um, I, I definitely want to have a copy of that presentation. And the next thing I'm going to do is ask our Invest Alberta. We also have uh, an investment corporation to attract. It's a kind of single window uh, uh, process. We set up that uh, Invest Alberta to facilitate and accelerate uh, uh, those deals. So I, I look forward uh, in, uh, to sign an MOU between Invest Alberta and Invest uh, India soon, if possible. Um, I also see others like Leah, um, uh, one of the good infrastructure uh, consulting company working in India. I'm in touch with uh, Dr. Raju, your uh, new uh, president there. Um, so they're doing important projects uh, for the pri which are important not only to the nation but to the government, like the uh, the projects in Varanasi and other projects. So uh, I'm I'm pleased to see that. And as government of Alberta, what we are doing to make life better for Albertans and Canadians is invest in uh, in uh, modern infrastructure. Uh, for that, to to actually legislate the criteria of project selection and prioritization, just uh, ten days ago, I I introduced and passed the Alberta Investment Accountability Act, which will give predictability and also uh, certainty uh, for Albertans and Canadians what type of infrastructure we are going to invest considering not only the current needs, but also the future needs. For example, COVID taught us recently, you know, how important is infrastructure uh, to, to carry on with our daily lives in, in a pandemic scenario. So, uh, so that's why we introduced that uh, Infrastructure Act. But, you know, people often expect uh, politicians as a magic to build uh, every fancy infrastructure they think of. We have our own limitations of funding because somebody has to pay for it. Uh, so that's why our, our government actually uh, is trying to pursue public-private partnership uh, to encourage private investments. Uh, so which we, we are on track now because uh, um, we we reduce corporate taxes in, in Alberta has the lowest uh, tax eight percent, and we don't have any uh, provincial sales tax. So with all that, Alberta is probably uh, the lowest, uh, one of the lowest in North America out of the fifty states in U.S. and ten provinces uh, in Canada. Probably we stand the lowest, um, and also we are on uh, we we cut a lot of red tape. To, to encourage uh, private sector investment. And uh, we are also using uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank to uh, finance vital infrastructure projects like broadband to rural communities or irrigation projects, because Alberta's strength is uh, you know, uh, natural resources. So we produce a lot of oil and gas um, as a cold country, you would appreciate today in, in, where I'm sitting in Calgary, it's minus 30. So without, uh, without those uh, comforts of the fossil fuels, reliable supply will be freezing. So, uh, but uh, we are also looking at diversifying our economy. We are looking at clean tech. Uh, 
other presenters uh, talked about uh, the importance of uh, renewable and uh, clean energy. So Alberta is the leader in uh, technology development and uh, supplying. For example, uh, I have introduced one of the Alberta companies ever. Ever is a geotech, uh, geothermal company. Uh, we connected them with Reliance uh, in, in India who are interested uh, to explore that. Um, same way, many there, there are many opportunities, but I'm glad to see India has opened it up. Recently, we realized uh, during the previous waves of COVID, uh, there was uh, uh, there were issues with uh, with uh, oxygen supply, for example, in India, because although they have, but they couldn't move it because the roads were not suitable to uh, to move 40 feet uh, sea container. Uh, type of trailers across the road. So that's why I'm very pleased to see Government of India is going to invest uh, on uh, roads and airports and seaports. So that, that's what in Alberta, we, so to compare between Alberta and, uh, and uh, India, Alberta, we, we are we're not dense population and we are spaced out. That's why we had to maintain these thousands of kilometers of uh, roads. Um, and bridges, and we are also focusing on other uh, uh, projects like broadband and aviation, irrigation. So that's where our investments are going. But what is expected from our government is to bring in accountability, consistency in policy, and cut uh, taxes and cut the uh, red tape, which we are on track. Um, and that's why recently we could, uh, I'm, I'm happy to mention that we could attract uh, companies from India, tech companies, because uh, although we are building on our strengths in uh, energy and, uh, uh, we, but we are also diversifying our economy. We are, uh, uh, we are doing a lot of value add in our agriculture and forestry, which is a bright spot in our economy. I, I heard that India is uh, is uh, recovering its economy post pandemic, and you'll have ten percent GDP. And Alberta will be the fastest in Canada with seven percent uh, GDP growth. Uh, so we we worked really hard uh, on Alberta recovery plan. We now stopped construction uh, in 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 my department. Uh, we we are on track to complete all the projects in construction, like 28 healthcare facilities, top-notch world-class uh, uh, healthcare uh, facilities, and we are building about 70 schools in uh, across the province, a lot of uh, justice infrastructure. So when you talk about infrastructure, it, it touches every sector. So it's, uh, it's essential to deliver uh, programs like uh, uh, much needed, uh, uh, you know, the uh, delivery uh, delivery of uh, public programs. Uh, it, so it could be economic infrastructure like uh, like uh, car trade corridors, roads and bridges, uh, airports, and all that. Or social infrastructure like I mentioned, hospitals, schools, uh, or uh, or you know the pipelines which are essential in a big country like Canada. Um, so we, we are focusing on all that, but uh, but there is a lot of potential between India and Alberta and India and Canada. You know you mentioned companies like Fairfax, our good friend Prem Watsas group. Uh, they they invested in uh, in uh, aviation infrastructure there, Brookfield. Um, bought uh, pipelines from uh, my previous employer, Reliance. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, air cargo, somebody mentioned. So Alberta airports like Calgary and uh, Edmonton, they're on the, uh, on the important route to US. So all the cargo that you, right now you're transitioning in, uh, in uh, Alaska, um, Alberta airports will provide you uh, very low cost options um, and the, the, the for refueling and also with our, our runways are much much wider and longer suitable for any sort of uh, uh, aircrafts. So there are a lot of opportunities and our premier Jason Kenney, which Vipulji and others uh, on the call are familiar, he's a good friend of India. He wants to uh, 
uh, develop, I mean, he, he, he was part of developing those relations in the past as a federal minister and uh, he, he, he can't wait till the COVID, uh, COVID uh, ends and so we can go and uh, sign up those uh, memorandum of understandings and connect private sector uh, um, uh, investors because there are a lot of opportunities uh, and, and recently I introduced him to uh, my good friend, uh, Tata Group Executive Chairman, uh, Mr. Chandrasekharan. Um, we invited him, he's waiting for the COVID to end. We're talking to uh, other companies like Biotech. I spoke to Dr. Krishna Allah, and I know that one of the Alberta companies uh, he has signed uh, and exploring opportunity with the bio e i i spoke to mahima datla she said uh, they 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 are negotiating that deal uh, there are a lot of opportunities in alberta and canada for indian companies but as uh, our job as politicians is to provide that consistent transparent accountable policies so investors have certainty we heard about the difficulties in the past when governments change, uh, we should not be tempted to undo what the previous governments did, like tearing off uh, contracts, uh, like power purchase agreement contracts or anything. That, that won't give certainty and, uh, and uh, predictability to investors, particularly Canadian investors. They are very good partners, but they look for you know ease of doing business and predictability. And we had to create the trusting relationships. As soon as the COVID ends, we would invite uh, uh, all the Indian companies to come and uh, look at our uh, opportunities in Alberta and Canada, particularly in Alberta, because we are going to open it up for uh, clean tech and. Uh, uh, there are opportunities in hydrogen, for example. We we want to uh, we want to build a lot of uh, uh, industrial uh, plants producing hydrogen. We already had few projects announced, three four projects. We're also looking at carbon capture and sequestering. That's other opportunity for uh, Indian companies. Uh, I heard that India is looking at uh, thousand uh, gigawatts. So that's you know, if your land base is not enough, Canada is a large country, second largest in uh, in, uh, in in the world, and uh, you, so they, there are opportunities because although it's cold here, minus thirty in Alberta, but the sun shines most of the time. So uh, your companies can uh, come and look at uh, Alberta as a potential uh, opportunity. So the, I, I, as I said, I can't wait to uh, connect uh, Invest Alberta and Invest uh, India. And with the help of uh, Anshumanji and his colleagues, we'll try to move forward that agenda. Um, but glad to be here. We would like to take uh, questions, but I'll stop there. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Minister Panda. Uh, and I must say, uh, you are one of the most approachable, uh, most down to earth political leaders I have come across uh, in my 22 years in Canada. So thank you for always being there, always uh, joining us. And uh, for sure, I will uh, share the presentation with you and uh, connect you um, to uh, uh, Rahul as well. And I uh, hope to see that MOU uh, materializing soon between Invest Alberta and Invest uh, India. Uh, hello, Amatuji, how are you? Good morning, Vipulji, I'm good, how are you? Good, good, good. So I believe uh, you are not driving. So we no, 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 I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Vipulji, Vipulji, can you take a quick screenshot of everyone? If everyone can turn on their cameras and uh, look yes, at the cameras. So just to put on our social media. Sure. Time for uh, a quick uh, group photo, everyone. Uh, Mr. Yadav, are you able to turn on your camera? Rajaji. Okay, that's fine. We'll I'll do it at the count of three. Okay, everyone look, smile. One, two, three. Oh. Okay, we'll do it again, Mr. Yadav. Okay, <laughs> join in at the count of three again. One, two, three. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Tejas. Uh, all right, so uh, let us go right next to our uh, next speaker, uh, Sir Glenn Campbell. Uh, Nagasrat, if you can bring up the introduction slide, please. <clears throat> Oh, 
for Mr. Glenn Campbell. Nagasrat. Um, just a second, Rupi. Yeah, sure. We are just running about 10 minutes over, so somewhere along the, um, along the way, we'll have to catch up. Hope, is it visible? Uh, yeah, well, for some reason, the last line always cuts off. Um, but anyway, um, Glenn Campbell, uh, our next speaker, he is the Assistant uh, Deputy Minister, Investment, Partnerships and Innovation at uh, Infrastructure Canada, which involves major project development and fostering partnerships with the private sector using alternative finance and delivery models. His responsibilities include support for the Canada Infrastructure Bank, as well as promoting public-private partnerships and use of innovative finance in the public infrastructure space. He is also responsible for federal major bridge construction projects and oversees portfolio coordination of Crown corporations, such as Windsor Detroit Bridge Authority and Jack Cartier uh, Champlain Bridges Incorporated in uh, Montreal, as well as federal interests in Waterfront Toronto Revitalization Corporation. Previously, he was ADM of the Canada Infrastructure Bank Transition Office, Director General of Financial Institutions at Finance Canada, responsible for domestic financial sector policy covering banking and insurance. His prior role at Finance Canada was as the Director General of International Policy and Analysis covering international financial institutions as well as global economic policy coordination under G20, G7, and IMF, and served as the senior finance official for APEC. Earlier in his career, Glenn was posted as finance counselor in New York during the global financial crisis. While most of his career was at Finance Canada, he has varied experience across federal departments, including Global Affairs Canada, Industry Canada, and the Treasury Board Secretariat. So over to you, Mr. Campbell. Thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. I'll try to abbreviate my remarks in, in the interest of time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Janney, and also uh, good day to the High Commissioner and, and Mr. Minister uh, Prada. I'm very pleased to join you today to foster collaboration and a shared experience and in infrastructure between our two countries. Uh, as pointed out, my role focuses on alternative finance and how to adopt and learn from others on leveraging private investment through partnerships to foster innovation and solve public pol policy challenges and in infrastructure. Before getting into specifics, let me share a few points to underscore my keenness to speak to you today. On the personal front, I'm married to uh, Indo-Canadian uh, diaspora, my wife and her father-in-law who grew up in Mon Mumbai. And I've had the pleasure to visit and travel across India many times. And over the past 10 or 20 years, I've seen a lot of the progress and opportunities uh, first firsthand. Uh, on the professional front, in my past roles uh, at the finance ministry, I was also uh, the lead on uh, Canada-India financial sector dialogue and uh, where we talked about collaboration between Canada, India and banking and insurance. And prior to that, collaborated with India and in major G20 activities, including co-chairing of the key macroeconomic framework committee for several years um, uh, in really good collaboration between Canada and India on the global stage. For the past five years, I've led Canada's efforts at the national level in promoting P3, PPP infrastructure opportunities. And as you know, led the uh, transition office to create the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Similar to India, the path to closing our infrastructure gaps must include leveraging the private sector investment and expertise and governments as well as the private sector need to be informed investors. In Canada, the majority of public infrastructure is owned and managed by our provinces as, and territories at, and the municipal level as pointed out by Minister uh, Panda. And of course, they have a lot more experience in direct planning, building and delivering on a day-to-day -day basis and, and face many of the infrastructure challenges really at the local level. Federally and at the national level, we have our own assets and challenges but largely focused on how we use national funding to determine and shape shared priorities 
and appropriate burden sharing over, over projects and infrastructure. Part of this is determining what are national priorities, which is why we are launching a new national infrastructure assessment and seeking to determine which challenges are better suited to government funding or where alternative and innovative approaches can be used to relieve the burden on the taxpayer. Canada as a whole has been contributing its expertise, cooperating and learning from others uh, experienced through the OECD as well as G20's Global Infrastructure Hub. Both international organizations doing an excellent job of collecting and disseminating knowledge and expertise in infrastructure, P3 on, and in <clears throat> project finance, including from both Canada and India, I might add. I was to, pleased to see recently India present its approach and new initiatives in public-private partnerships to the Canada Council for Public-Private Partnerships, a, a major global conference held here in Canada last month, and it echoes some of the comments mentioned today about how advanced uh, India is becoming in the, in the P3 market. Very, very formidable. India has some exciting opportunities around monetizing assets and asset recycling, and looking at ways to crowd in private finance to help solve public policy challenges whether roads, water, wastewater, electricity and broadband and then other sectors, uh, it, we've really taken note. Um, of high note is our two largest pension funds, Canada Pension Plan uh, and Investment Board and Ontario Teachers Pension Plan uh, have recently invested considerably for a 50% share in India's National Infrastructure Trust. Um, this will be a, an extension of investments in Indian toll highways uh, and other assets. These Canadian funds, including AIMCO, uh, that I know is speaking a little bit later, uh, and pension funds like them as part of the Maple 8, or private funds like Brookfield, which I heard earlier, um, represented uh, by others on today's panels, are really keenly interested in investing in, in India. And I would hope Indian investors uh, are keenly interested in reciprocating the opportunities in Canada, include those that Minister Panda had set out, uh, particularly in, in, in Alberta, but also elsewhere. In Canada, we are still in early stages of adopting more revenue models where infra is priced to create revenue streams to attract private investment. We're perhaps a bit more focused on greenfield investment and where um, risk can be transferred in, in new builds. Uh, a little bit more sensitive on the, on the brownfield, but we, we're both learning from what India is doing uh, and other countries. So we're watching very closely what our peer countries uh, are doing to, to deploy these new models and also looking keenly at the public reaction. We have revenue models in electricity and transit, but we remain behind on roads, bridges, water and wastewater. And we look forward to learning from India's uh, progress in the future. In terms of new priorities, Infrastructure Canada and the Government of Canada have engaged on a national infrastructure assessment initiative, as I mentioned, to help guide future needs and priority setting that will really help guide uh, at the national government and hopefully coordinate provincially as well, uh, developing a pipeline of projects, both uh, publicly and privately, that will help draw attention uh, to where investment is best placed, both government and private sector. Uh, let me conclude by talking about some clear priorities going forward. We center around two themes and we think they'd be the same in Canada as in India. One is reducing GHD emissions and our carbon footprint in building and operating infrastructure, whether public or private. And two, building more resilient infrastructure that mitigates the severe impact of climate change. Both of our countries have been inflicted with severe weather and events with Canada dealing with severe flooding in BC and Atlantic Canada and high fire incidents and threats across Canada, particularly in the West and melting permafrost in Northern Canada. We need to encourage our supply chains and infrastructure ecosystem to continue to innovate and build more carbon sensitive infrastructure and to develop new means and methods to build cleaner and more resilient infrastructure. This is an area of global importance and I trust our cooperation can continue in mutual investing in our economies, sharing best practices on models and approaches to funding and financing, but also sharing technological solutions through business to business relationship. In, in closing, I uh, also note uh, Invest in Canada and the Canadian uh, Trade Commissioner Service and Export Development Canada being available in the ecosystem to help facilitate further trade. Thank you very much. Look forward to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, for the uh, precise and brief uh, uh, to the point remarks. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, so also good to know that you have a very strong connection to India. Uh, 
So, you know, waiting for your next trip to India. Uh, you know, maybe we can share some experiences. <laughs> All right. So, before um, we go to our next uh, speaker, Terry Bonas, I think uh, it is uh, best now to break up the sessions and uh, take up our first Q&A uh, session uh, for the first four speakers. So um, I have two questions for each of the first four speakers. And in the interest of time, if you can keep your uh, uh, answers a bit brief uh, so that we can then go back to the session two. Um, so I will start with the, uh, with the High Commissioner uh, Anshumanji. Uh, my first question uh, for you, sir, is, uh, is that infrastructure projects often run into litigations, environmental clearances, land acquisition issues, face uh, center state coordination issues with different party led governments having different priorities sometimes, you know, as uh, Mr. Pandas just mentioned. So how are these challenges uh, being mitigated? Uh, thank you, Vipulji. And uh, just uh, uh, quickly, uh, the new infrastructure project from very conceptual stage in India are being de-risked in a, uh, several uh, measures being built into it. Uh, one is the importance that has been accorded to the participation of state governments, because they are in India, like in Canada, uh, being a federal government, uh, a federal uh, structure. Uh, the state governments are largely responsible for several of the aspects that you have mentioned, including land acquisition. So these aspects are now being handled much more carefully, much more closely monitored uh, under a large de-risking program that is making the projects inherently uh, less litigious, uh, I should say, in terms of risks as we go ahead. Uh, the second, which I touched upon briefly, is the uh, integration of all the project monitoring and management under various umbrella schemes, like the Gati Shakti allows us to have a geospatial uh, framework under which all the projects of infrastructure in India are being mapped using precise mapping from uh, ISRO. Uh, this allows, uh, you know, reduces the friction space, uh, which often involves in terms of uh, uh, property rights and uh, lack of records, uh, which prompt the litigation in first place. So these are some of the, the de-risking strategies, uh, which India is using for some of the major uh, projects as we move ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, clarification, sir. Uh, my second question for you is, uh, you work with uh, Canadian companies, pension funds, and business leaders on a daily basis. Uh, while the official government-to-government -government ties may be performing a little bit under potential for a while, it is the private sector that is largely driving the bus these days, or at least that's the impression. Uh, so what do you hear from the Canadian C-suite executives about what are they most optimistic about and what concerns do they want addressed so that they can participate more enthusiastically in the uh, growing India story. Uh, absolutely, uh, Vipulji. Uh, I'm so glad that you asked us that. Uh, 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 I think uh, the growth trajectory of India-Canada relationship is a testimony itself to the kind of strong complementarities which exist between the two economies and the confidence which Canadian CEOs have uh, especially the, the heads of the various investment uh, uh, organizations in Canada on the strength of Indian economy. Uh, see, there is an asymmetry. Canada has a population of 38, 39 million. Uh, this is a, a G7 country, but the overall market size of Canada is quite limited. And Canada is still a, essentially a primary product exporting nation. My biggest portfolio from Canada is of primary products. Uh, so that's why, you know, uh, places like Saskatchewan figure very highly in, in our bilateral trade. So their trade has grown over the last five years, as have investments. 
most of the investment uh, has come in terms of private equity and, and portfolio investment from Canada. And that itself, you know, the, the Canadian investors have put with the, their money where their mouth is. The investment have risen from 5 billion 2015 to over 55 billion today. And that itself is an is a indicator of the confidence which the Canadian uh, CEOs have. Over a thousand companies are now located and, and doing business. Uh, Canadian companies are located and doing business in India. We see increase in number of uh, uh, business visa, for example, as COVID winds down. Uh, that shows that there is a desire for people to go and uh, you know, engage India. We have seen an increased number of uh, business queries, uh, both from India and from Canada in terms of engaging on a commercial basis. So moving forward, we see uh, commerce and, and investment and trade as being the, the driver of our, our, our bilateral relationship. I mean, the political noise uh, is there and uh, like India, Canada is a, is a multifaceted, noisy, uh, thriving democracy. It's, uh, it's only natural that those noises will be there. But the core of our relationship, I think, is gradually moving towards a more uh, commercial, more business-oriented, more business-led relationship, which I think is uh, is how it should be. Thank you, sir. Uh, 55 billion thousand companies, that's fantastic to hear. And uh, we hope to see that number double over the next few years, uh, hopefully. Um, so my next uh, question is for Rahul Agarwal for uh, Invest India. Um, again, two questions for you, Rahul, as well. Uh, my first question for you is uh, private sector investment in roads and highways through the PPP route was 25,999 crore rupees around 2015 or 42%, which came down to 25,000 crore rupees or 16% around 2019, while the bank loans for this sector also came down from 15.2% in fiscal year 2015 to 11.5 years, 0.5% uh, in 2018. So what efforts are being made to reverse the tide in both the private sector investments and bank loans for this critical sector? Thank you, I think that's a very well-researched question. Uh, so I think there was a change in strategy in how we were building our roads. So till uh, 2014, 2015, we were, doing a lot of uh, PPPs, right? The BOT style PPPs uh, uh, in roads. Uh, you know, there were issues there. I think, uh, you know, I think the primary issue was that, you know, the same developer had to take the construction risk as well as the traffic risk. Uh, and, and, and I think you've seen, you know, that's you know, generally not the easiest and uh, taking both these risks make the capital very, very expensive. So from 2015 onwards, actually, we changed our strategy a bit. Uh, we divided the, the traffic risk and the construction risk separately. So what, what we started doing is that most of our construction today is happening either in EPC uh, or a hybrid annual model, as we call it, uh, which means the, that the capital required for from the private sector for constructing roads, uh, the require, that requirement went down substantially. Uh, making it cheaper to construct roads in India. So that's why, you know, you see those numbers, right? So, you know, the private sector was not taking loans from the banks, neither they were investing their own capital. They were actually focusing on constructing best quality roads at the best uh, possible price. Once these roads were constructed, that was the time when we started, uh, you know, inviting uh, global pension funds and private equity investors to come and acquire those roads and use that capital you know, from that acquisition process to again construct the road, you know, which is that our, our asset recycling model. So that was there. Uh, we again want to go back to the standard BOT uh, model, but on limited number of roads where risks are minimized as you know, I think, and I think uh, the high commissioner talked about uh, the land acquisition environmental concerns, you know, the way we have handled that. So only on certain projects, where we have taken, you know, we have made sure that those risks do not exist for private sector, as well as we see high feasibility uh, for those projects. Only there we want to invite uh, BOT uh, projects. Otherwise, we want to reduce the cost and go on with what we are doing right now. 
Uh, fair enough. So the second question for you is uh, while the large pension funds and big Canadian companies are already investing in India, what efforts are being made to reach out to smaller funds and companies in Canada and in the overall global investment in India's infrastructure sector? Where does Canada stand as of today? I think uh, for institutional investments, uh, uh, specifically in infrastructure and real estate, I think Canada is, uh, uh, I think I've not done numbers, but I think most likely uh, you are at one, maybe two. I've not uh, really done numbers uh, at that level. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think on, on the first part of the question to re for reaching out to smaller funds, I think uh, uh, this team, which I represent, uh, the Financial Investors Initiative team, uh, we reach out, uh, you know, uh, we you know, we reach out to every investor uh, 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 in in the country, in Canada, or in or elsewhere as well, uh, to tell them the opportunities. And you know, I can confidently tell you that uh, we are in touch with uh, a lot of pension funds, much smaller in size, uh, for investing in uh, India. Uh, you know, Invest India per se, we work with all uh, you know all size of companies, whether it's a startup or a large scale corporation, and we are very happy to facilitate on investors. Uh, at that level. So that's the one part of it. Uh, the second part is that, you know, I think uh, we have created opportunities in India where smaller investors can also, also participate. So the likes of Invits, you know, I think we recently had a, uh, a Invit for transmission. Uh, so one of our public sector undertakings for transmission, which we call Power Grid, uh, where any investor, as in any institutional investor of, uh, you know, of any size can actually come and invest in India. Uh, we have the NIIF, uh, which invites uh, institutional investors to participate and invest with them uh, who do not have large capacities on the ground uh, to invest uh, as well. So we are open to all sizes uh, and happy to handhold and facilitate them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ravji. So, uh, Mr. Panda, I'm coming next to you. Uh, my first question for uh, Mr. Prasad Panda. Um, you have worked on uh, massive infrastructure projects in India and now oversee the infrastructure ministry for Alberta, making you the ideal candidate to bring Canada and India closer on this particular file. So where do you see the possibilities and potential, especially between Alberta and India? And if the potential is not being fully met right now, why do you think that is the case? Mr. Panda? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, that, that's a very good question, Vipulji. I, the, the potential has not met because we heard from uh, Anshman that uh, they, want, uh, they want their infrastructure investments to be tripled in, uh, in a few years, which is a very ambitious uh, goal, $4.5 trillion. Uh, Canadian companies, uh, they, they, they uh, although, uh, as Rahul said, right now they may be they, uh, they they have a presence there. They may be high in numbers right now, but that's that's uh, nowhere uh, near the potential because Canadian companies have capacity and they have the expertise. Uh, because Canada is a large country, so our as I said, we are uh, sparsely populated and. Uh, uh, unlike India, which is densely populated. So we we need to uh, create infrastructure and maintain it. So our companies have expertise, our governments, so provincial governments, each government has expertise. So there is a lot of opportunity out of that uh, $4.5 trillion. That's a big cake. And uh, Canadian, uh, I, I know I'm competing here with my good friend, I saw Amarjo there. And I know Anshman is trying to create a tension there between Saskatchewan and Alberta to compete, and Alberta is ready to, uh, you know, um, <laughs> with, with the help from people like Glenn, I'm glad to hear his son-in-law of India. Me being Amchi Mumbaiker, it's more important that your uh, in-laws are from Maharashtra. So with uh, good ambassadors like that, when they collaborate with uh, our uh, Indian uh, bureaucrats, uh, like the consular generals in Toronto and uh, Vancouver, we our companies can step up and help India. What India needs to do is uh, to cut the red tape and facilitate that. 
Uh, I have seen that uh, from private sector, uh, from my past life, having worked on mega projects in Gujarat, uh, it's it's a possibility. Uh, Canadian companies can contribute, uh, but we had to cut that red tape. And there is a lot of potential. And India is also fastest growing economy. And uh, they and Canadian companies, particularly Alberta, can uh, feed with our agricultural products. Uh, we can beat Saskatchewan for sure. Scott Mo, I spoke to him. He is very uh, you know, he's very eager to even increase that business between Saskatchewan and uh, India. Same thing with Doug Ford, and I'm sure Amar, Amarjot will talk about that. He'll do his sales speech, but we are all eager to come and have a uh, reasonable share of that and be part of that growth story of India. Sure. Um, so the second question is, uh, Alberta is facing multiple challenges both within the Canadian policy perspectives and from the once reliable partner in the United States, uh, whether it is Keystone or Enbridge Line 5, you know, or uh, we don't know who might, what might come up next year. Um, Alberta is also prepared uh, a 20 year strategic capital plan, as far as I understand. Yep. Uh, where, where do you see your province five to 10 years from now, emerging from today's challenges because a healthy and prosperous Alberta is vital for a healthy and prosperous Canada as well. Absolutely. That's uh, actually, I forgot to mention yesterday, we uh, released the 20th strategic capital plan. Um, that was part of the uh, Infrastructure Accountability Act. I introduced and passed in Alberta legislature 10 days ago. With that came this 20th strategic capital plan. To, to, which is a long term, it's not just, so each budget year, uh, we bring in capital plan, which gives the forecast for the next four years or three years. Whereas this 20 year strategic capital plan looks at the long term emerging trends, uh, not only the current trends, but the emerging trends with the improvement in technologies and modern uh, infrastructure needs. Um, that, that's why we introduced that. I hope that will uh, provide the opportunity uh, for future governments to plan infrastructure ahead. But you mentioned most of Alberta's exports are all going to one country. So we are dependent on one customer because all our pipelines are going only in one direction, which is south to United States. So we are selling it's not just Alberta, it's, it's the Canadian product which is sold at a discount to US because we are struck with only one customer. Whereas on the other hand, India with, uh, you know, they need thousand gigawatts of energy. It takes time to get there. In the meantime, Alberta and Canada has a potential to provide that energy security for, for India. So, we, we need to look at that, and I am counting on all uh, 1.8 million Indo-Canadians to speak up and represent to the government of Canada, because they have the lead. I can talk endlessly on the bilateral relationships, but, but Alberta don't have the jurisdiction. The government of Canada has the jurisdiction, and we need the uh, uh, government of Canada to take the lead in diversifying not only the products, but also diversifying the markets. Countries like India, the fastest growing uh, countries with 800 million young population, middle-class population with uh, growing uh, aspirations. So we Canada can uh, feed and fuel, as I said before, So, but we need the uh, uh, government of Canada's help. And all of you, I encourage you to represent to the federal government as well. And Alberta will play our part. And provincial governments are very eager to work with India. As I said, government of uh, Ontario, government of Saskatchewan, those two premiers I spoke a few times. And our premier is very, very, very keen in, uh, in advancing those relations, so both uh, trade relations and also cultural relations. Thank you, uh, Mr. Panda, for that. Uh, so now this is uh, uh, the next uh, set of questions are for Glenn. And then uh, we'll go to our second uh, session with uh, Terry Wallace, uh, Deepak Tarda, and Ahmed Mubashir. Uh, so my first question to you, Mr. Campbell, is uh, 
Canadian technology and Canadian investment in India's infrastructure sector is growing, mainly through private efforts uh, as of now. Now that Canada is facing challenges with China and also with the US on several key infrastructure projects, how keen is Canada today and in the days to come to reach out to and work more closely with India in this sector and beyond? Thank you for the question, and uh, let me just uh, support what Minister Panda had said, and you know, in full agreement that Canada has always needed to diversify its markets, um, and particularly those growing markets, uh, in India in included. And it's very important we set up really the the policy frameworks and the trade related frameworks and then encourage our mutual private sectors to really do that uh, country to country business to business connection where capital flows and technology go hand in hand and and I think India does present uh, continues to present a, a real opportunity and followed by our pension funds which I hope uh, and other infrastructure funds that they also encourage deeper supply chain considerations along the lines that Minister Panda had mentioned is, is making sure that we're not just managing capital flows in particular projects, but as they're being procured, are we really thinking about the wider net that benefits both, uh, both countries? And uh, let me end by saying Canada and India continue to collaborate through the G20 and OECD, which is the best for, uh, you know, for uh, developing mutual transfer of technology and, and, and policies like around procurement. Okay. Um, as they say, adversity also brings with it new opportunities. Um, what are the priority or focus areas for Infrastructure Canada moving forward, both within Canada and in terms of uh, overseas collaborations? So in terms of within Canada, to mention, uh, the Government of Canada is really an informed investor of using our, our spending power in helping provinces like Alberta and Ontario who are here to achieve our shared objectives. And let me just echo, there's a lot of alignment in between the, the, the federal government and the provincial governments in, in meeting our infrastructure deficit. And I think the government of Canada is shifting more towards what are the key needs of uh, communities. And there's been a big focus on transit uh, also now more so on the generation and distribution transmission of clean power, uh, moving towards a, a cleaner net zero economy. Those are two really big priorities, but um, we, we ask also to think about not just big projects, but small community projects and the inclusiveness of, of the infrastructure agenda so everyone can participate. And then internationally, um, you know, we're going to continue to to encourage other countries like India to develop you know, those stable long term policy frameworks to, to really attract uh, and retain that kind of investment. And, and I think even beyond the, uh, the programs India has put in place as of late, providing that longer term stable framework is what really is going to attract more uh, private investment from Canada. And, and in Canada, we should do the same to attract uh, Indian investment in Canada. Thanks. Thank you, um, Mr. Campbell. So that concludes our first session. I would request all the speakers for the first session to stay back with us if they can, uh, while we now move to the second session. Uh, <clears throat> so our next speaker is uh, Terry Wallace. Uh, Nagasrath, if you can uh, bring up his uh, introduction slides. Uh, slide. So Terry Wallace uh, is the president of uh, LEA Consulting Limited, and he manages operations of the LEA Group in Canada. Over the past uh, 30 plus years, Terry has worked in the fields of transportation planning and traffic engineering, environmental assessment, civil design, and construction for projects, including transportation infrastructure and land development from project planning stages until completion. Uh, Terry is also involved in international projects, including those in India, overseeing Canadian participation and providing project input based on his experience. Terry has been involved in projects requiring extensive transportation planning, traffic operations engineering, functional and detailed design for EA studies, civil and municipal engineering design, official plan reviews, secondary plans, corridor traffic impact studies, 
major utility relocations and feasibility and cost benefit studies. He has been extensively involved in the civil design aspect of major rail and transit infrastructure projects, including conceptual design, planning, and public consultation, environmental assessments, detailed design of road and transit infrastructure. He has been actively involved in guiding uh, years activities in India. So over to you, uh, Eric. Thank you very much, V. Paul. And uh, good afternoon and good evening, uh, or good morning to uh, the participants here, depending where you are. Um, I'll just... Uh, to share my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see that. Yes, yep. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about um, the Lee Group somewhat, and uh, we're a consulting engineering firm, so, so we provide professional services uh, in engineering. And um, I'll, I'll try to focus my comments on um, you know, the, the benefits of um, you know, a Canadian company working in India and uh, what happens in, in return. Um, and also uh, to talk about how Canada and India can work together in infrastructure, um, technology transfer and, and things like that. So, I mean, just to give everybody an idea, uh, the Lee Group, who we are. So we started as a Canadian consulting engineering firm. Um, so we had Canadian offices um, in the beginning and we really just worked in the Canadian market. And uh, then one day we decided we wanted to do international work. And um, we won a project in India uh, quite a few years ago. We opened an office, uh, hired staff there. And uh, a few years later, we are uh, 2000 plus employees working uh, across the Eastern hemisphere. Um, with work that's largely being administered through a, an office in New Delhi. And uh, our footprint today is re really across the globe um, uh, in Canada and uh, in, in many other countries. So uh, perhaps um, coming back, I, I'm, I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing uh, some faces on my screen. Is it blocking the presentation on your, uh, for what you folks are seeing? No, we, no, can, we, see can, the we can see it perfectly fine. Oh, okay, good, good. Um, so, so perhaps using our, our company as, a, as an example, uh, you know, as a private business, um, what Canada and India have in common, um, both uh, countries are really building infrastructure rapidly. Uh, the largest cities are growing very fast. So when uh, we looked at India, um, our focus was civil engineering, uh, especially for roads and rail and transit, and uh, some services in transportation planning. Uh, we initially needed to find a local partner and we did that. Um, we bid on some projects um, and, and as we got to know the lay of the land and the uh, environment, um, made contacts and friends uh, in India, um, we could expand and grow and bid on more projects and, and really grow a business. Um, and what we, what we looked to do was to continue to offer up new innovations and uh, technologies. And uh, you know, the really important thing was how, how we add value to our clients that, that we are working for. Um, smart cities was one example uh, in India where there was a great opportunity for us to get involved uh, and uh, provide some uh, input from Canada on that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, as a private business, uh, again, uh, if you ask how, me how governments could help private businesses, um, 
I've been to a few um, forums and trade missions uh, from Canada to India, which were uh, uh, great opportunities and great experiences for private businesses to, to see what's going on there. Um, and, and really to meet players and uh, get to know other firms that, that we can work with. Um, Canadian Trade Commission also is a, a great partner for private businesses to uh, help us work in any other country. Um, emphasizing and demonstrating successes of private businesses working between Canada and India, I think that would be a um, great opportunity for the governments to um, promote uh, working between Canada and India. Um, you know, take our example of our company, uh, uh, which is, I think, hugely successful working in Canada and India, and IBI Group, uh, Deepak, um, will be talking about their successes in India, I'm sure, as well, after me. But um, just, just demonstrating how um, businesses can benefit and how the, the flow goes each way once those um, uh, benefits and connections are realized. Um, emphasis on international engineering students. Um, governments could probably um, provide greater emphasis on that. Um, we, for example, we decided to um, start a work term scholarship at a Canadian university uh, quite recently. And um, rather than having a work placement of that um, Canadian student in Canada, we decided we're going to have them placed in an international location, most likely in India. And um, the uh, reaction at the university was overwhelming there. Uh, we had a lot of interest. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic has really put a, a hold on that, but uh, we're waiting for the pandemic to uh, finish so that we can get back on track with, with that program. Talking a little bit about uh, um, transferring uh, skills and technology. So for us, uh, obviously a small investment in India um, um, led to a very large return. Um, as a corporation, we, we benefit not only from the additional revenue and profits that come through the growth in, uh, in, a, in the company by um, having overseas operations, but from the large pool of employee resources in India, which is far beyond what, what Canada can offer. Um, and as I showed from our New Delhi office location, we're really managing work throughout the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, so really at the beginning of our initiative, the Canadian operations supported um, the growth and um, startup in India. Now it's a two-way street and uh, uh, the India operation supporting Canada and uh, Canada supporting India, and it's going back and forth. Um, some examples of that, um, like our Lee India office supports uh, Canada in things like travel demand modeling, which is a, you know, a, a high tech um, engineering uh, application, uh, CAD and BIM support. Um, Lee Canada supports uh, Lee India in uh, ITS and smart city planning and, and uh, other elements. And uh, we're having some of our subway um, design engineers travel to India to have conversations with contractors and, uh, and government officials there. Um, just uh, for example, on travel demand modeling, um, Canada, our Can Canadian office first introduced it to our India office a few years ago. Uh, the software is, is actually developed in Montreal and uh, the, the application is widely used through North America. But um, having uh, introduced it on a few projects, our, our Lee India office now um, takes the lead on that application for uh, any of our projects, including those in Canada. And uh, we, we, uh, in Canada, we go to them for that. A um, little bit on the smart city projects where uh, we were working on two of them in India. Um, you know, a lot of technology introduced into the smart city projects, um, video crime monitoring and uh, waste to energy applications. 
uh, smart meters for water management and energy management, uh, smart parking features, telemedicine. The, these are examples of some of the um, applications that are being applied in, in the smart city planning. Other ways Canada and India could work together in infrastructure. I know P3 was mentioned and uh, um, some of the speakers have talked about the P3 model in Canada and India. Um, in, you know, in, I know in Canada, the P3 model is evolving uh, and improving. Um, alliance models and IPD models are now becoming very popular uh, in infrastructure. And um, you know the goal of these uh, refined models are really to reduce costs and have all the parties benefit from reducing costs and uh, limiting, uh, um, I guess, lot liabilities to make it more attractive for the private sector to, to invest in this. Um, there are bodies who um, provide uh, information and uh, have expertise in Canada and, and perhaps something that governments could do is um, bring along these organizations um, to, to work on international P3s and, uh, and, and bring their expertise with them. And, and I think that's a two-way street as well because uh, India has been doing a lot of P3 work in the past. And I'm sure both countries could benefit from um, the experiences and, and the uh, expertise that's there. Anyways, that's just a um, very short uh, introduction of uh, our firm. And I think we, we uh, have enjoyed a huge success being a Canadian company working in India. Um, I know everybody involved in our company uh, is very proud of uh, what we have achieved. We're, we're an employee owned company. So we have shareholders in India and Canada who uh, have ownership in the firm. And uh, it's a uh, in our view, it's a, it's a really a great model for uh, a business. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Wallace, uh, for that, uh, for the wonderful presentation. And to also know that uh, Leah is very happy to be in India. Um, you know, we hope uh, you continue to stay engaged and grow your operations further uh, in India as well. So uh, let us move now to our next uh, speaker, uh, Deepak Prada. Um, Deepak uh, is a global director for innovation for IBI Group. Um, as the head of IBI Group's Office of Innovation, Deepak is driving IBI's transformational pivot to a technology-driven design firm through focused efforts, catalyzing core growth, transforming IBI's business models, exploring future tech disruptions in the industry and fostering innovation. Deepak also leads IBI's Smart City Sandbox Initiative, a unique partnership between public and private sector industry leaders whose goal together with the startup ecosystem is to bring innovative new technology solutions to urban environments. Prior to becoming a global director of innovation, Deepak built IBI Group's presence in India from the ground up into the significant contributor to the firm's international operations that it is today. Deepak is an alum of the Harvard Business School and holds a master's degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT and a bachelor's degree from IIT Bombay. So over to you, Deepak. Thank you, Vipulji. Uh, I think my previous uh, speakers uh, gave me a great background to, to really uh, uh, talk about this. I think a lot of the stuff was already covered by the Honorable uh, High Commissioner, uh, as well as uh, I think Rahul gave a pretty good uh, uh, overview about what's happening in India. So let me, can you guys see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, so I think this slide sort of captures uh, the growth that is there in India. I think uh, it's very clear India today is a 3 trillion economy, like by 2030, it will be about a 10 trillion economy. It houses 14% of the world population. 
The current infrastructure plan is around 1.5 trillion for the next five years. In the urban space, India is going to invest around 255 billion and in transportation around 500 billion over the next five years. So again, uh, I think there is nothing new that I can say here uh, other than what uh, Rahul actually presented in much, much more detail in, in terms of what are the opportunities on the Indian economy and everything. But what I thought that given, given my background, uh, um, I, it would be worthwhile for me to talk a little bit about India-Canada success stories. And again, as, as Ripulji mentioned in my background, like I had the uh, opportunity to really build IBI operations from scratch in India, uh, which is around a 200 people operations now. And then from there now I have moved to Canada uh, uh, to take up the global innovations role. So I, I sort of had that perspective of running and building a business in India and how Canada leveraged uh, that and now how we are leveraging India to basically bring, bring that back into Canada. So wanted to share maybe just four quick examples in terms of things that uh, we have done where there has been an impact from Canada into India and, and, and now vice versa. Uh, so very briefly, IBI, we are a, a integrated practice of intelligence buildings and infrastructure. So we design buildings, we design infrastructure, and we look into technology within buildings and infrastructure. So that's in a, in a quick summary about IBI. So let me just get into the four success stories that I really wanted to talk about. The, the first one was when we entered India, as, as was also mentioned by Rahul in the presentation, India had this big program or still is having the big program about uh, national highways. And uh, projects were coming online. And at that time, the government was really looking into technology for tolling. And it was very quickly realized that given the amount of traffic that is there in India, we really need to look into electronic tolling. Um, and given the scale of India, everyone was actually looking into getting the technology in. Uh, so at that point, uh, uh, the government had appointed Mr. Nandan Nelkani to, to sort of head this committee and sort of drive and, and suggest which technology should be actually chosen for, for India as a way forward. And luckily for us, like because of the leverage that we had in Canada, where we were working on some of the cutting edge technology on tolling here, like we were able to get all the inputs in terms of what would be the right things for India. And uh, we were happy to contribute to, to this committee to uh, select uh, RFID technology, which is 18,006C. And that is what has been adopted. Uh, so again, it was a small intervention, but we were able to do it because of the expertise that we had developed here and we were able to quickly bring it to India, which, which I think now has a very national impact. Uh, and this is the impact of the technology choice. Uh, India now has a fast tax program, which, which I think is the biggest now in the world. Uh, it's hosted by about 35 bank. Um, it covers around 700 plus plazas in India. Uh, number of uh, vehicles passing every month through this tag program is over 200 million and, and it's collecting like 31.77 billion like uh, rupees every every month. So huge impact. And again, I think from uh, Canada contributed in one way from the Kennedy uh, for the choice of technology, but now what we can really learn from India is how really you can implement it and scale it. I think it is fabulous to see how India has implemented this in the last six to seven years. And, uh, and now where 80 or 90% of actual collection is now happening through the ATC, uh, where I don't think there is anywhere in the world where, where that much penetration of ATC has happened. Going on to my second example, uh, this is uh, transforming India in the areas of sustainable transportation. So again, India had this program of how do we make our cities more adopt uh, sustainable means in terms of transportation. Uh, so it was looking in non-motorized transportation, public bike sharing scheme or transit oriented development. So that is what something India had thought about and how do we really implement it. And again, given our expertise here in Canada, we were able to quickly leverage that team and bring those people as team leaders within our team. And I think picture says a thousand words, like you can see that a mix of our Canadian colleagues and, and my team in India, where we collaborated together to really redefine uh, this, this paradigm in India. And like in the, in the words of my own colleagues, uh, like the, the lead, they, they basically said it, it, uh, this project gives us an immense opportunity 
as well as shivers because the work that we are going to do is going to impact about 1 billion uh, people so so again just that expertise but the impact that it can it can create is is huge um, and and i'm happy to say that we delivered uh, this framework for the for the country these are available as guidance document by the ministry of urban development and uh, very happy to actually launch it and then we work with different cities to actually get some of these actually implemented on the ground coming to the third example like um, i think many of you might be aware that uh, india has this mb had this program of 100 smart cities and given our strength in india and given our expertise in canada we were able to bring all that together and then we we actually partnered with city of bhubaneswar to actually submit their proposal for the smart city and uh, bhubaneswar was selected the uh, as the number one city in the 100 smart cities challenge uh, it was based on the holistic approach that was put together in terms of how infrastructure should be built up how technology should come in and how we are going to solve the problem of the citizens. So again, the, the, the interdisciplinary uh, nature of IBI and our global expertise, we were able to actually make it happen. And then we sort of continued with Bhubaneswar to actually now realizing this entire thing in Bhubaneswar, where we are sort of looking into the entire technology footprint for the city in terms of different uh, IT systems, city services, uh, like revamping like the traffic systems etc and implementing an integrated uh, like in intelligent city operation system right that that is what we sort of uh, uh, are now helping the city to execute that uh, we have also been helping the city to really revamp their infrastructure and 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 change the city landscape change the place making or change the urban fabric of of the city uh, and uh, part of that, we have also implemented this large control room, which sort of brings everything together. This is probably the largest control room like uh, at a city level in, in India, which sort of looks into all the different services coming together. And, and uh, it became one of the core centers for all the cyclone mitigation, all the support that was being provided by the city, as well as in the current ongoing pandemic. Um, and again, from a success story perspective, like again, we have uh, held hands of Bhubaneswar throughout the journey, where we have helped them in terms of building the basics, setting their benchmark, facelifting to Bhubaneswar, really revamping what Bhubaneswar is about, the, their, their profile in the country, and like really reimagining their assets. So again, as a result, uh, today, Bhubaneswar is considered to be one of the most livable cities in India. It's first in the citizen perception survey, and it's the second in the most livable cities in India in less than uh, a million population. So again, a huge impact because of the expertise that we were able to bring there. Uh, and uh, needless to say, like this, the city and, and all these projects have won many, many awards internationally as well as, well as within, within India. So that's uh, essentially my third example. The fourth one, uh, again, is uh, coming back to Rahul's point about huge opportunities in India. So India has some of these ambitious programs like the Bharat Net. Bharat Net is the ambitious program of really bringing rural broadband to like around 2.5 lakh communities within India. Uh, so it's it's powering the 2.5 lakh communities and providing them up to 25 megawatt uh, Mbps of uh, of data coverage, and again we are really proud that we are associated with this uh, uh, project. We are doing around 20,000 communities out of the 25 uh, lakh communities that are there. So we are we are there in Chhattisgarh. We are working in. Uh, in Raipur, we recently got uh, things in, in Andhra Pradesh. So again, a huge opportunity. And again, all that was, was possible because of the resources and experience that we had. So we had worked previously on Alberta Supernet, where we actually had looked into the entire design and implementation of Alberta Supernet. We have been working in the New York region here uh, in terms of the telecom network and SWIFT in terms of the business plan. So again, bringing that expertise from here into Canada, held, uh, into India, sort of helped us to get those projects. And also we brought the experts from here and took them to India to actually help us 
in, in this new area that, that we, we launched our expertise. So overall, I think that uh, Indian economy definitely offers great opportunities. I think my examples would have shown that it's not just opportunities, companies from Canada can actually leverage the opportunities and convert them big and really contribute in a meaningful manner. Uh, I think India, Canada, like they can be great partners, as I said, uh, in some areas, Canada can lead, but there is a lot of learning that then happens in India that you can actually bring it back uh, to, to Canada or other parts of the world. And, and the third area, which, which really is my passion, and this is my role now in IBI, is about the tech ecosystems. Canada has great uh, tech ecosystem. The the uh, uh, the Waterloo, uh, Toronto, like uh, uh, corridor has huge startup ecosystem. India has a huge uh, tech ecosystems, and and that's something that I think we want to leverage. We want to bring stuff from India to here and from here to 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 India. So so that's my quick uh, remarks as far as uh, the India story is concerned. Thank you. That was a fantastic presentation, uh, Deepak. And you know, uh, we feel like moving back to Bhubaneswar. Uh, so thank you for uh, for doing what you are doing in India. And uh, I believe uh, Deepak has another meeting in about five minutes. So um, let me ask him uh, his two quick questions, and then I will move to the next uh, speaker, Ahmed uh, Mubashir uh, from AMCO. Ahmed ji, with your uh, apologies, um, I will ask uh, two quick questions to Deepak first. Um, so the first one is uh, innovation means inherently innovation means something new, something out of the box and futuristic, while the governments and their bureaucracies are generally associated with slower decision making and being averse to out of the box innovative ideas. So as a global director of innovation for IBI group, how do you match innovation to governments, and where do you see India, especially in becoming more future ready? I, I, I think uh, uh, my experience has been that uh, India has been leapfrogging. Like some of the examples where where I have actually uh, myself been involved. As an example, uh, the first example that I gave on ETC. It took Europe about twenty years to figure out the technology that has to be implemented into Europe. And in India, uh, we, we chose the RFID technology, which was just like two years, like it was not completely proven, but India was willing to take the risk to, to pick that technology, given the cost effectiveness from an Indian environment perspective, the market perspective, the penetration it could create, and actually jump into it, believe in it, and sort of accelerate that, right? So that, that's an example of uh, innovation in, in my mind, where a technology was not proven for like 10, 15, 20 years. It was two years or something into it. And then we made it as a national standard and sort of uh, took it forward. Uh, and examples like smart cities that are happening, I think uh, uh, those are things where it offers huge opportunities. Yes, I think government cannot focus on like small, small elements, but like I think it is then up to companies like us, how we fit some of those innovative things as a part of the projects or as a part of execution. Sure. Um, IBA group does uh, projects in, uh, in Israel, in Canada, in USA, UK, Oman, UAE, and other countries. Do you see a similar global trends and priorities emerging uh, globally or each market is still unique and different in terms of uh, where it wants to be 10 or 20 years from now? I, I think each market is, is a, you, unique. In my mind, a company has to be global. Like they, they have to be global where they have that expertise, but they need to understand local. Like you cannot apply a global solution just locally. It has to be really customized to that uh, area or that country. And every country or uh, has its own nuances, the business nuances, how you do business, what are the things that should, would work, what would not work. So again, we always look at local. We look at how to bring the global expertise, but make it local. Uh, and, and that's our mantra. Sure. Thank you for that, uh, Deepak ji. And uh, apologies for going a little bit over time. Uh, but I think uh, it was nice to hear from you. Um, so. You. Amarjot, I think he is right now in California. Um, are you still there, Amarjot, or 
Do you want to come back a bit later? No, I'm here. Okay, sure. So, Amarji, sorry once again. Uh, just a quick a couple of minutes for uh, Amarji Sandhu. Um, Nagasara, see if you can bring up his profile quickly. A little bit of improvisation in the <laughs> sequencing. Uh, this is the agenda, not this one. Okay, so Amarjo Chandu is an MPP for Brampton West. Um, he arrived in Canada uh, in 2008 as an international student and went to George Brown College in Toronto. He later became a realtor with uh, Royal LaPage in Brampton. Amarjo Sandhu is the member of the provincial parliament for the riding of Brampton West and he is a parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Infrastructure, Government of Ontario. He is also a member of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts and a member of the Standing Committee on uh, General Government. He is the first uh, international student to be elected as a representative to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. And he currently resides in his riding of Brampton West uh, with his wife and his two kids. So Mr. Sandhu is right now joining us uh, from the car. So over to you, Mr. Sandhu. And then after this, we have two more final uh, speakers, um, Mr. Ahmed Mubashir from AIMCO and uh, Mr. Prasad Gadkari from NIIF India. Those are the last two speakers. So over to you, Mr. Sandhu. Uh, thank you so much, Vipalji. First of all, my apologies. Uh, as I told you that I'm on road, so I'll be not able to turn on my camera right now. Uh, but I'm ha very happy to be here with uh, my good friend, Honorable Prasad Pandaji, Minister of Infrastructure, Government of Alberta. Uh, Honorable His Excellency Anshuman Gorji, Acting High Commissioner of India to Canada. Uh, Rahul Agarwal, Vice President in West Canada. Glenn Campbell. Uh, Assistant Deputy Minister, uh, Investment Partnerships and Investment Infrastructure in Canada, and all of the other uh, great speakers uh, participating here today. It's great to have the opportunity to share uh, updates on Ontario's exciting and growing infrastructure projects. I will speak to our experience and the challenges and how we, keep, uh, we can continue to build uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. I will speak uh, to the important relationships that help and um, support these critical infrastructure projects and how we are working together uh, with other regions and countries such as India uh, to make it through similar uh, challenges. Our government has been uh, working tirelessly to close the infrastructure gap in every corner of our province. Uh, the pandemic has presented us with some unique challenges, but Ontario has never, we recognized the then see uh, the situation called for Canadians. This is top priority because of what it means for people's quality of life and providing them with the supports and services they need, such as the delivery of vaccines and PPEs, which have been vital in navigating. Okay, we are having some audio issues. How much is it? Throughout the pandemic. Support other regions and countries such as India. Uh, yeah, no, go ahead actually. From time to time, actually, yes, yes, for now, yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Ontario is proud that during such a difficult time, we were able to support other regions and countries such as India by providing important health supplies uh, to help the country manage ongoing outbreaks using crucial medical equipment. Ontario and India benefit from robust government to government, and both sides continue to grow. Uh, bilateral trade and investment responsible for thousands of jobs in both jurisdictions and close cooperation in education, tourism, and research. Let me share an important statistic. Uh, more than 100 Ontario-based companies have a presence in India, and more than 60 Indian companies across all sectors have operations and investments in Ontario. This is why the Indo-Pacific region is the priority region for Ontario as the province navigates the pandemic and seeks to identify new trade partners in Asia to help bolster the resiliency of supply chains to support the growth of Ontario's small and medium-sized enterprises. India's economy offers tremendous opportunities for Ontario companies in sectors such as transportation infrastructure, life sciences, clean energy technology, and renewable energy, as well as in traditional sectors such as infrastructure development. 
management and defense and security. As we work to develop uh, partnerships between Ontario, India, and the Indo-Pacific region, we continue to plan for an to quickly structure across the province. Our investments and efforts are also creating good jobs and spurring economic growth, which is critical for our communities to not only recover from the pandemic, but also to thrive uh, in the years to come. In fact, Interior's uh, planned infrastructure investments over the next decade total more than $148 billion. This includes investment in critical infrastructure like healthcare, long-term care, education, transit, roads, bridges, courthouses, and other public, other types of public facilities. Uh, planned public-private partnership projects include, for example, a crucial transit projects such as the Ontario Line, a 15.6 kilometer standalone rapid transit line. Uh, and the Go Rail expansion, which will transform the transportation network in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area over the next decade. They also include uh, hospital builds and renovations, such as the construction of the new uh, McKenzie's Health Cartology Vaughan Hospital. Uh, we're building and upgrading roads and bridges, such as the construction of new uh, twin bridge north of the existing Credit River Bridge and rehabilitation of the existing Credit River Bridge, uh, including widening the QEW and replacement of the Mississauga Road overpass. Uh, the work on projects completed through the P3 model is done uh, with the support and assistance of our Crown Agency Infrastructure Interior. Since IO was established, it has brought over 130 major P3 projects uh, to market by working with the private sector. Uh, the P3 market update, a list of public projects in the pre-procurement and procurement stages that Interior is investing in currently includes 38 major P3 projects totaled and estimated 60 billion in contract value. Regionally and locally, we have uh, continued to forge ahead, supporting 424 eligible communities in rural northern areas across the province throughout the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, also known as OSIP. Last month, uh, through our fall economic statement, uh, we committed an additional 1 billion to OSIP over the next five years, which works out to an additional 200 million each year to build and repair roads, bridges, water and wastewater infrastructure in communities across the province. And we're investing up to 10.2 billion of federal, provincial, and partner funding through the Investing in Canada uh, Infrastructure Program. Uh, this program supports infrastructure projects uh, through five streams, including rural and northern, transit, community, culture and recreation, green and COVID-19 resilience infrastructure. Throughout infrastructure programs like OSIF and IC, we're getting shovels into the ground faster than ever before on hundreds of projects in Ontario. Reliable internet and cellular help access help people stay in touch with friends and family uh, during these critical times, access public services like healthcare and education, run businesses, work from anywhere in the province, create jobs, and enhance economic growth. By investing in our infrastructure, we're investing in our economic future, enhancing our economy. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you today. I look forward to more opportunities for Ontario and India to work together to build a strong Ontario for today and for generations to come. Thank you, Amarjo ji. Yeah, I will just ask you one quick question, although you have already addressed part of it uh, already. Um, yeah. Ontario is very actively engaged with India, as you, as you just mentioned, uh, in terms of the physical and virtual trade missions, as well as people-to-people -people ties. In terms of the infrastructure sector specifically, where is Ontario-India engagement right now, which you already partly uh, addressed? And what can be done or is being done to increase that engagement? Uh, very good question, Ripoji. You know, uh, as I mentioned in my speech, that Ontario and uh, India benefit from robust government to government engagement, uh, growing bilateral uh, trade and investment responsible for thousands of jobs uh, in both jurisdictions and uh, close cooperation in education, uh, tourism, and research. And India was the lar world's largest, the uh, fifth largest economy in 2019, uh, making it priority market for Ontario. Uh, sectors in, in India identified as having key opportunities uh, for Ontario companies uh, that include advanced security, agriculture, uh, automotive, healthcare, construction, infrastructure, environmental infrastructure, and wastewater, power, and telecommunications. Uh, and one of the initiatives, as uh, Anshuman Gorgi, uh, he was uh, mentioning, you know, uh, initiatives such as the uh, Gati Shakti uh, Master Plan, uh, the Smart Cities Mission, and others in India present. Interesting opportunities uh, for Ontario companies specializing in uh, 
uh, professional services, uh, big data, logistics, and pr project delivery. Uh, so our Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade uh, currently, as I said, they lead uh, virtual trade missions to help uh, build and strengthen um, important trade relationships and reestablish disrupted supply chains for priority sectors. Uh, delegations to uh, key industry events such as the upcoming convergence ICT conference in March and the Municipalica uh, trade show in November uh, next year would see uh, that interior infrastructure companies participate in targeted meetings around potential opportunities uh, under India's uh, Gati Shakti master plan, uh, the national infrastructure pipeline and the smart cities mission. And uh, our ministers, uh, you know, uh, definitely COVID has slowed down uh, the great, uh, you know, uh, uh, progress India and Ontario made in the last couple of years. Our two ministers of economic development and trade, uh, they led a trade mission, very successful trade mission, in fact, uh, to India, Vic Delhi and uh, Minister Todd Smith. And uh, on behalf of the government of Ontario, I would say that we'll continue uh, to strengthen the cultural and economic ties uh, between the two countries in the coming years. Thank you, Amajoji. Thank you for uh, for joining us. Um, drive safe, and uh, we'll uh, we'll connect again soon. Thank you, sir. Okay, so let us now move to our next uh, speaker, um, Sir Ahmed Mubashir. After this, uh, we'll ask a couple of questions to Ahmed, and then two questions for Terry uh, Wallace, and then uh, the last uh, presentation will be from uh, Prasad Gadkari. Um, so Nagasrath, if you can bring up the slide for Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed Mubashir is a director uh, in the Infrastructure and Renewable Resources Group and heads the infrastructure investing in Europe and Asia for Alberta Investment Management Corporation or AMCO. Uh, Ahmed joined uh, AMCO in a direct investment uh, role in 2011 and brings a wealth of experience in the energy and finance sectors. Ahmed has led uh, transactions in the midstream utilities and renewable energy sectors and serves on multiple university company boards. He also represents AMCO on the advisory committee for the G7 Investor Leadership Network. Uh, Mr. Ahmed uh, holds an MBA from the University of Alberta and a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from McGill University. Ahmed's work experience prior to joining AMCO includes working as a field engineer at uh, Schlumberger and Short Steels in investment banking and financial advisory at Morgan Stanley and Deloitte respectively. He is a registered professional engineer, woman practicing with the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta and is a CFA uh, charter holder. So over to you, Mr. Mubashir. That, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vipul. I appreciate I, I may be the, the second last speaker over here and um, running behind schedule. So I'll try to make my uh, comments brief. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this panel. Um, just, I guess, uh, a high level uh, about uh, myself and the company that I represent today. So as you mentioned, I'm a director in the Infrastructure and Renewable Resources Group. Um, I head uh, infrastructure investing uh, for Asia and Europe out of our London office. Um, I work for Alberta Investment Management Corporation. So we are an institutional investor based in Alberta and we uh, invest on, on behalf of you know, government uh, sector pension plans, endowment funds and other especially government funds. Um, we have roughly about 150 billion of assets under management. A portion of that, which is roughly about 12 billion, sits in the infrastructure group, and I am a director in that group. You know, when it comes to our style of investing, it's uh, indirect investing, which essentially means that we uh, look to um, invest uh, directly into assets without really going through a middleman or a fund in most circumstances. Um, you know, our, uh, I would say, journey into India is sort of in nascent phases uh, right now. Um, and as, as you asked, a lot of speakers have already talked about it, so I'm not going to go into the details, but there is definitely lots to like about the India story. Uh, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister vision, 
of self-reliance for India and having infrastructure as a core pillar to be able to get there, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the economy, it's one of the largest in the world. It's one of the fastest growing economies. You have a population size, which is roughly 1.4 billion and vast majority of them are, are young, educated. Um, you know, when you look at the political and, and legal systems, definitely speak well with what we are used to in Canada and the medium of instruction and communication is something that we are very well versed with. So there are lots of reasons for investors to go in on a macro level into India and there are enough evidence of a lot of our peers doing that. If you look at, um, you know, OMERS, Ontario Teachers, PSP, CPP, CDPQ, um, all of us have heavily invested in India and, and will perhaps continue to do so. You know, uh, our journey into India again is um, on a direct investing basis is quite new. Earlier this year, uh, we invested in a renewables uh, investing platform called Verisant. And, um, you know, the, the Honorable High Commissioner also mentioned um, some of the changes that have come about. Um, and, and, and this is sort of a testament to that. So Verisan was going to be the first renewable uh, invit uh, that was created. And the invit structure with its tax efficiencies and other benefits for uh, investors is one of the ways in which India has made investing in infrastructure easier. I mean, we obviously have inwits in the telecom space, the road space, um, you know, the transmission space. And of course, now we also have inwits in the renewable sector. Perhaps just concentrating a little bit more, focusing on the renewable sector. And then the reason why we see a lot of promise in it is, is when you look, if you think about India and the rate at which it's growing at, and you look at what the energy demands for India would be in the future, um, coupled with the fact that the government has plans to take the current installed capacity of about 170 gigawatts of renewables to 450 by 2030, that only means there's going to be a lot of tailwinds for this sector. And AIMCO, on behalf of its clients, want to be able to participate uh, in these tail uh, in the sector to be able to make uh, good risk-adjusted returns for our clients. Um, you know, for us, getting into um, Verisant is perhaps a first step, you know, um, of, of getting uh, and getting more experience in, in investing in, in India. But I can definitely say that we are looking forward uh, to this journey of further building um, our, our experience and doing more in, in India. Okay, so um, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Mubashir. Uh, so I have a couple of questions for you, and then I will go to Terry, um, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, AMCO, as you mentioned, has over $150 billion of assets under management. Actually, you have already partly answered this question. How much of that is in India, actually? And why did you choose India? And where do you see AMCO in the emerging India story going forward? Yeah, I mean, the thing is that AIMCO is, uh, as you can imagine, the 150. Um, I don't have the split of how much would exposure we would have to India because infrastructure is a very small component of the 150 billion that of assets that we manage on behalf of our clients. Um, you know, I, I think uh, on the infrastructure side, I, I can answer that, uh, you know, we have an increasing exposure to India. While we're starting small at the moment, um, but we do feel that uh, we have a lot of runway um, uh, to, to build on that. I would say when it comes to areas that we want to focus on, it is uh, things like um, renewables, as I mentioned, and the transmission development that would be required to support the renewable proliferation within India. Um, that is a sector that we are very much interested in. Um, a second sector that we are also keeping a keen eye on is the transport sector, and we're looking to see how we could play that in the future. Okay. Um, when you invest in a private company, people these days also look at their ESG record, um, environment, social governance. Uh, 
um, I think that is also uh, an area of uh, priority or focus for AMCO as well. So does the same criteria apply to nations also? Because the sector like infrastructure does impact all three, environment, social and governance. Absolutely. I think, you know, that's the one thing that we are very proud of is our um, ESG track record. Actually, we have a dedicated group within AIMCO, which is called Responsible uh, Investments. And we liaise with our Responsible Investments group on every investment that we do. Um, you know, you, you, I, if I can say that, uh, you know, when it comes to um, ESG benchmarking in the infrastructure space, AIMCO, along with some of our peers, um, you know, were the founding members of Gresby Infrastructure, again, which benchmarks infrastructure funds and firms on their um, ESG efforts. So we've definitely been on the forefront on the ESG side. I can tell you that uh, we take our ESG philosophy and also implement it um, across all of our investee companies uh, and where we have the influence, definitely look to influence them to incorporate all the best practices that we've learned through our um, ESG and responsible investing experience that we have across the globe, across various different asset classes. And we've successfully been able to do that and we'll continue to do that wherever we invest. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Mubashi. Thank you for uh, joining us today and also staying with us uh, till now. Uh, um, so uh, we once again uh, look forward to connecting with you soon. And uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, to be inviting you to in-person uh, roundtables that uh, we will be hosting soon. Um, so thank you uh, for the same. Uh, thank you. Now I still have two questions to ask uh, to Terry before we can go to our final presentation today from uh, Prasad Gadkari of uh, NIIF. Uh, so Terry, I think you have already addressed my first question, but I will still ask anyway. Um, if you can tell us about uh, LIA International's experiences in India. I mean, you have done projects in India, but if you can tell us how that experience has been and about your plans going forward in India. Yeah, well, the, the experience has been um, tremendously great. Um, I think growing from uh, four people on one project um, 20 years ago to 2,000 people uh, working in India today um, would, would suggest that, um, you know, it's been a great experience for us. We want to be there and um, it, it's worked out really well. Um, you know, it, and when, when uh, companies grow like this um, in new regions, those, those entities in the new regions take on their own, um, their own way of doing things and um, you know, become less and less reliant on, say, the, um, the initial um, initiator like Canada. So um, one of the benefits we're seeing is that uh, our operations in India are becoming more and more self-sufficient. Um, and and uh, largely the, um, the work we do for the um, national highways or India railways, um, largely being managed by people in our New Delhi office. Um, so we're at the point now where um, just w whenever some expertise is needed from Canada, we, we, we provide it. Wonderful. Um, and your company also has done projects in more than 50 countries, if I am uh, not wrong. Uh, where does India rank in terms of planning, executing these projects, and the ease of doing it in comparison to some of the other markets? And where do you think India can improve to become a more attractive investment and manufacturing destination? Yeah, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question for our, our firm. Um, we, we have a president of international operations who would be much better, and unfortunately, he could not attend today. Um, I, you know, um, the uh, the countries we venture into, a lot of them, uh, especially when we go for the first time, um, I'm, I'm sure there are always challenges in setting up the projects and dealing with the currencies that uh, the, the project is done in. Um, 
So I, I think having worked in India for much longer than these other countries, the ease of work in India is obviously uh, well, easier for the company to deal with. Um, I think every every country has its unique challenges, um, both uh, traveling and living conditions and uh, uh, the governments to deal with. Um, I mean, mo most of our work is through international lending agencies that, that we work with on overseas projects. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think dealing with uh, those types of contracts is pretty um, customary or standard for us now. Um, World Bank and uh, African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank. Um, so I, 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 I can't really answer the question um, on where it's more difficult to work in, um, but we're, I think we're, we're continuing to work internationally and uh, it hasn't, hasn't, certainly hasn't reached the point where we're, we're getting dissatisfied with uh, working in any particular country. Okay, yeah, fair enough. That's fine. Uh, we need to understand. So we'll ask that question to John next time. Uh, next time we can uh, grab uh, hold of him. Uh, so thank you for joining again today, uh, uh, Mr. Wallace. Now we have the final presentation from uh, NIF India. Uh, I think that they have a lot of good information as well that you may want to see. Um, so Nagasrat, if you can bring up the introduction for uh, Prasad. Uh, this is our final speaker, final presentation for today. Um, although it has gone uh, way over time, but I think it was all well worth it uh, for all uh, what we have heard today. Uh, so Prasad Gadkari um, is the Executive Director and Chief Strategy Officer for National Investment and Infrastructure Fund for NIIF uh, in India. Uh, he has got over two decades of experience in areas of private equity, principal investments, joint ventures, project finance, and corporate and policy advisory. He is currently the chief strategy officer at NIIF and is responsible for the strategic initiatives and policy advisory function. Prior to joining NIIF in 2017, Prasad was the managing director at TBS Capital based in Mumbai and prior to TBS, he was a partner with IDFC Private Equity focused on investments in core infrastructure and social sectors. Over his almost decade-long stint with IDFCPE, he handled several important deals, including India's first infrastructure holding company, an oncology care chain, largest airport privatization deal, a water management business, and India's first student living solutions company. Prasad has also worked with General Electric, where he was responsible for infrastructure investing and joint ventures in South Asia, Middle East, and North Africa region. Prior to GE, Prasad was with IDFC Limited in their project finance group, where he handled some of the earliest project financing transactions in the country. He was also a key member uh, of the team that provided policy level inputs to the government of India uh, for their initial privatization transactions. Prasad started his career in 1996 with Larson and Two Bros infrastructure finance business, just around the time India started experimenting with infrastructure uh, privatization. So it's uh, relatively late, I think it's almost 11.30 at night uh, for you in India. Uh, Prasad, apologies for, uh, for uh, holding you back for so long. Uh, but I am sure you might have enjoyed the uh, presentations and the discussions that we had so far. So looking forward to another uh, informative presentation from you. Over to you. Thank you, Vipulji, uh, and good evening to all of you. I hope I am audible. Uh, yes, we can hear you just fine. Yes, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, thank you for, for inviting us and it's been fascinating to, to listen to everybody uh, right from the High, High Commissioner, Mr. Anshuman Gorji, uh, Rahul's again made a, obviously a, a very punchy presentation on what is happening in India and, and uh, he's obviously lightened my work. A lot of what I would have spoken about, he's already covered. Uh, it was great to hear uh, Mr. Pandaji uh, from an Alberta perspective um, and, and, and generally from all the speakers to, to 
get a sense of what's actually happening in Canada also. You know, obviously, we are so India focused and we do track what's happening globally, but uh, uh, some of the insights were very useful. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and frankly, I have, I have four, uh, four uh, uh, points I wanted to, to make. Uh, and uh, as I said, some of it has already been covered, so I'm not going to I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on what's already spoken. Let me know if you can see my screen. Uh, is it visible? Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, you know, uh, and I, uh, Vibhulji, I hopefully I'll help help make uh, make up for the time for you to and run through this quickly. Sure. Uh, I think the programs we have already heard. There are two large programs. So I'm not going to go into that. The uh, I think the only point I want to make on this slide is uh, two large and massive programs, right? 1.6 trillion. And, and, uh, and I heard some of the speakers, uh, and I know investors are interested in operating assets, especially pension funds and financial investors. But I also heard uh, some of the speakers talk about development assets and greenfield. And, and, and India clearly offers both these opportunities in abundance. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the detail. The other part of this slide is really, again, uh, some of it was spoken about to the tax benefits uh, which the government has accorded. And, and uh, I think as uh, Mr. Gore made the point, you know, a lot of it was in interaction with the Canadian pension funds. And I think the government has been extremely responsive and proactive to tailor the, the tax benefits uh, so that they can attract the, the global investors, you know. But, uh, but uh, you know, uh, I think that's not the full story. The full story is across a bunch of things. Uh, the government, uh, in fact, over the last four or five years has been tweaking, changing policies, bringing new things uh, and making life easier, you know, ease, uh, making uh, uh, and, and ease of doing business. You know, it's no, it's no longer just uh, another word. You know, there are specific things, whether it's the single window clearance system, which is being put in place, whether uh, there are dedicated spots which have been put in finance ministry for each investor. And some of it we have been intimately involved with, so, so we are exactly aware of the details. So every investor actually has been mapped to a, a senior official in the Ministry of Finance who they can directly reach out to, to so as to navigate the system, resolve its queries. So there are a bunch of measures, I think, which the government has done and which I thought I would want to highlight. The second point I wanted to make was, again, a little bit it was touched upon in the previous presentations, but I wanted to just re-emphasize what the government has done is they have actually tailored products and structures, whether it's project structures, whether it's investment products. Uh, I think the government has been in a listening mode and, and uh, they have realized uh, that between construction contractors, infrastructure developers, uh, pension funds, sovereign funds, private equity funds, uh, each one of them, find, uh, although they may be bringing capital in, uh, they bringing capital in. They have different horizons, different risk return spectrums they work on, different styles of investing, and therefore, what the government has done is actually shape and tweak policies and structures so that you have something which is tailor made for every category of investors. And I'll give just two examples. In the highway sector, we talked of BOT and, and we talked of challenges, and and what the government then did. They came up with these two formats. One is the hybrid annuity, which is essentially geared towards contractors who can take construction risk, but don't want to take market risk, traffic risk, and all of that. And that's a great model which works for them. On the other end of the spectrum, they came up with this scheme called toll operate transfer, which is called TOT scheme, which is takes away the construction risk, but gives you the market risk, the financing risk. So first kind of uh, projects is attracting contractors and the people who can provide development capital. And the last category is attracting pension funds, infrastructure funds. Then they have this infrastructure investment trust, the inuits, which uh, I think several people refer to. That is really geared towards people like, and I think IMCO has invested is what they said, you know, people who, who are interested, but who don't want to fully jump into the sector or don't want to become very active. It's great product for people who can, who want to earn a yield, who want to get to know the sector in a little more passive way. So, you know, so I think this is again, second point I wanted to highlight and, and I don't want to go into every other point, but basically uh, they have created these product and structures and on the right side of the slide, you can see, uh, I've just listed, these are all global investors, you know, so, you know, obviously you can recognize several of the Canadian names, whether it's uh, CPPIB, Ontario Teachers, you have Brookfield, you have CDPQ, but also we have other people from other markets. We have the KKRs of the world, you have Cube Highways, then you have the Singaporeans with the Port of Singapore Authority, GIC, which is the sovereign fund of Singapore, 
Uh, we have the Middle Eastern investors, whether it's Adia, whether it's Qatar Investments. So across the global, you have zero Zurich Airports, which is doing a Greenfield Airport. So each of these products actually have attracted the best and largest of the global investors. I think that was the second point I wanted to really highlight. Uh, and then I wanted to quickly lay before you amongst various products uh, and things which have got created. Uh, one uh, amongst them is, is again my company, which is the National Investment and Infrastructure Fund. We are practically a four or five year old animal, uh, you know, relatively new. Uh, and we are, uh, we are a category, what is called a sovereign linked fund. We are not a pure sovereign wealth fund. And we are not a pure play of private equity fund. Uh, we are some, something in between. And, and some people refer to us as a sovereign linked uh, fund. Uh, today, perhaps we are the largest uh, infrastructure focused kind of private equity funds in the Indian market. And we invest through three different strategies. We have actually created three different funds under the NIF umbrella. Uh, the first fund is a pure infrastructure fund. It's about $2.3 billion in size. And through which we have been doing core infrastructure assets. And the reason I'm highlighting this for you is, is, is for some of you who would want to invest in India in a financing vehicle, and I provide you that. But also, if you want to do joint ventures or want to take up projects, each one of what we have done is under each of my funds, we have a dozen entities we have created, and that's the below box. So under my infrastructure fund, we have actually four different companies which we have created. One is a ports and logistics joint venture. It's a joint venture with Dubai Ports. We have a renewable uh, company. It's a joint venture with CDC of UK. That's about three gigawatts. Our logistics venture is the number two logistics company in the country. We have a company which is doing smart metering projects on power distribution. Uh, that's a joint venture with a public sector company called ESL. Uh, we own a company which owns and toll roads. It's called Athang. That's a fully owned platform under NIF. And we have a project specific tie up we have been doing with Zurich Airport. So that's my airports venture. Then under my second fund, which is called Strategic Opportunities Fund, this is a little bit like a private equity strategy. Uh, we are in a fundraise mode. We haven't closed the fund. The first fund we have already closed, and I'll show you who the investors are. The second fund, we are still in a fundraise mode. We are talking to investors. We have got some of the first two investors, and now we, we are in the process of onboarding the balance investors. This is following a little bit of a private equity strategy. We have done two investments. One is a large infrastructure debt financing platform, almost $2 billion in size now. And one is a healthcare platform, which is really owning hospitals all across the country. We own almost 23, 24 hospitals all over India. And this is the second largest hospital chain in the country. And then we have a third vehicle, which is really what we call a fund of funds vehicle, through which we have incubated five different kinds of funds. One is a pure climate focused fund. It is, you know, as we speak, we will be announcing the closure. When I say closure, which means I will finish the fundraise. Uh, this is about $700 million fund, possibly the largest single country focused climate fund focused in a private equity style. Uh, and, and that fund is doing water, solid waste management, electric buses, battery storage, different, different kinds of things as uh, businesses they are incubating. Then we have a fund which is doing affordable housing all across the country. Uh, and then we have one affordable healthcare fund and two private equity focused funds. So again, in a nutshell, we have, uh, you know, I just want to show maybe this slide quickly. Uh, across all of these sectors, you can say from core infrastructure to private equity, we have a dozen entities. And these are all businesses and companies under the NIF structure. Each of these companies has their own management teams, employee base teams, uh, and they run their own businesses. So that's, that's the third point I wanted to highlight. And the last point I wanted to make, uh, as NIF, I think we've been extremely fortunate to attract great um, uh, uh, network of partners. And, and again, the names you can see here are people who are actually investors, shareholders, joint venture partners. These are not MOUs or people who we are thinking. Eh? These are real joint ventures or investors with us. Uh, the topmost corner is, is my parent investor, which is the government of India, obviously, which is our largest investor. But NIF, you know, and I probably I forgot to highlight, NIF, the government has created as a public-private partnership, which means we are a private sector animal. Government has given us $3 billion, but they are a minority. They have actually given the majority stake in NIF to all of these investors. Investors own 51% of NIF. So that is our founding investor. Then we have some of the largest uh, pension funds and several are from Canada, as you can see. We have CPPIB, Ontario Teachers, PSP. We have Australia's largest pension fund, uh, which is Australian Super as an investor. Then we have two of the sovereign wealth funds, Abu Dhabi Investment and Temasek from Singapore. 
we have the multilateral banks, which is Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, Asian Development Bank, New Development Bank, uh, and, and the DFC from the United States. And we have some of the largest Indian financial institutions, which is HDFC, Kotak, ICS, and Axis. All of these are financial investors into NI. On the right side are all our operating sector or railways or in the, on the, or in the renewable energy side. Then some of the uh, bottom ones are global partners, so Dubai ports, Zurich airports, CDC of UK, British Petroleum, uh, and the bottom uh, quartile is really our private equity partners. So, so I, you know, uh, I think, as I said, uh, I'm happy that we have been able to attract great partners and I'm looking forward to more partnerships from more Canadian investors, both financial and operating. Uh, I think that, Vipulji, with that, uh, I'm going to close. You know, th those are the four or five points I wanted to really share today. Happy to take if you have any questions. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for uh, for the fantastic uh, presentation, uh, Prasadi. Um, yes, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, the High Commissioner to join us back. Um, so my first question is, as you just mentioned, NIIF investors also include a lot of Canadian uh, funds, uh, CPP investments, teachers pension plan, homers, etc. So can you tell us what do the Canadian investors want from India? I mean, is there anything different than what the Singapore and Australian investors expect? Because we have a strong people-to-people -people ties uh, between Canada and India, which is a bit more stronger than what we have with other countries. And what has NIIF been able to deliver for them so far? So, uh, uh, Vipulji, um, I think, uh, you know, I would say the Canadian investor, you know, you know I, I don't want to compare and contrast investors, but, but clearly uh, uh, the Canadian investors are one of the most evolved and sophisticated investors, especially when it comes to infrastructure as an asset class. They understand it intimately. And what I think the, the great thing has been, obviously, they, whilst they are investors with NIF, we work with them as partners on a lot of actual on-ground project situations, on some of the policy measures with the government. And they have been very forthcoming, proactive in engaging with the government, coming up with very constructive suggestions. And it's been great to work with them. So, so several of these policy measures, which I showed you, actually have happened in conjunction with some of our investor friends and several of them were Canadian friends. Uh, and they have been very constructive in, in offering solutions. So I think that's been, you know, so that's how the partnership works. So while they are financial investors, we operate really at a multidimensional level is what I would say. Okay. Um, and NIF is also an active member of the One Planet Sovereign Wealth Funds, um, a global platform that helps organizations understand climate change risk and explore investment opportunities around the transition to low emissions economy. Canada under the present government is talking big for a while about climate change and the low emissions uh, economy. India, of course, is also betting big on green and uh, renewable energy. So what role can NIIF play in bringing Canada and India closer on this particular file, which will provide massive opportunities for both? So, um... You know, I would say, as you say, you know, rightly pointed out, we are a signatory to uh, to the framework, and um, I think we uh, we take that uh, you know uh, responsibility uh, very seriously. And uh, again, uh, at a multiple levels, we we are operating uh, on on those principles. So one is uh, you know uh, environment, and whether it's environment, social governance, as ESG it is called, is a very integral part of how we invest. You know, we have one of the largest number of professionals. You know. Uh, uh, which we have employed across all our network uh, and every investment that we take up has to go through a strong ESG filter is one way I will answer your question. Second is on a financing and investing side itself, uh, you know, as I outlined, we have, we have actually focused on creating vehicles which will help in climate transition in mitigation of this. I, I, I showed you the fund which we set up, it's a called Green Growth Equity Fund. It's, uh, as I said, largest ever climate focused private equity fund perhaps definitely in Asia, but might be in other parts of the world. Uh, we have a, another renewable energy which venture which you have created, which is only doing renewable energy projects. We have done a smart metering venture, which is actually aiding conservation of power, efficiency, and all of that. So I think we are, again, operating this at a multi multiple levels. Uh, one is through our ethos and principles of investing. 
and secondly actually creating vehicles and and we are happy to continue to partner with our canadian friends actually on both of these initiatives that's what i would like to think about this sure thank you fair enough uh, well said uh, prasad ji so um, let me uh, go back to the uh, the asc uh, uh, anshuman ji uh, i think we have come to a close uh, it went uh, almost an hour over the scheduled time but the presentations were so fantastic you know the experiences that we heard were so good i think it was all more than worth it um so if you want to make any final comments uh, before i give my closing remarks and then we can end the session uh thank you vipul ji and uh, thanks to all the wonderful speakers we had today uh and the presentation and information which they provided uh it only reinforces our strong belief that uh, uh there is a lot of potential for canadian investors in indian infrastructure sector uh we have we have uh, demonstrated quite clearly in several of our presentations uh how a conscious effort has been made to monetize and to make investment easy uh in the indian in infrastructure sector for a range of investors whether you are a small retail investor or whether you are a large uh, pension sovereign fund uh, all range of opportunities are available uh it's a growth oriented market uh as uh, uh, mr prasad said uh, you know canadian uh, funds are very sophisticated run by very smart people and they have made a choice they made a clear choice that the kind of returns which they are looking at the indian market uh, especially the indian infrastructure sector is going to provide uh it was also emphasized that this is actually a closing window uh think of it as a kind of uh, uh advanced tip on the market uh, for you to invest uh, here uh, the opportunities are going to become more competitive as we go ahead uh, so this is an early bird call for investing in india of joining our uh, growth story at this point and ride along with us as we grow and prosper so again thank you everyone uh, special thanks to to minister prasad panda he has been a good friend to us uh, uh in alberta we have great ties with the government of alberta thanks also to uh, to mr amar jyot sandhu uh behalf of uh, government of uh, ontario uh ontario is a major uh, trade partner to uh, to us uh with alberta we actually have investments in alberta uh in hydrocarbon sector uh, in northeast gas pipeline our companies uh, are still there in in calgary actually uh, trying to restructure that deal um uh, uh minister knows that we do buy uh, alberta crude but we buy it in houston and and not on the west coast of canada so uh, uh but again thank you so much mr minister for for being here your presence elevates the the whole conference and reinforces uh the strong faith we have in the growth potential of india canada partnership uh thank you also to all the the investment partners uh, mr wallace uh from uh, uh and and uh, i think uh, uh we had emco i don't see them but uh, uh thanks again for your time and presentation uh to my indian colleagues from uh, niifm and invest india wonderful presentations uh we couldn't have said it better uh and thank you again mr vipul jani ji for organizing this uh, uh we are uh, uh, you know we have been a strong partner to you and we hope to continue with uh, working with you in future thank you again Sure. Thank you. Uh, any last uh, thirty second closing remarks, Mr. Uh, Panda? Sure. Uh, thank you all, particularly our friends from India, staying up late. Uh, apologies, it took longer, but it's a very uh, informative session, um, and uh, I could uh, I could uh, reiterate the energy. and the passion the diplomats uh, uh, like anshuman ji and uh, uh, everyone else here in in our embassy and in our consulates they they it's uh, the services are elevated they are very responsive uh, in uh, in consulates in bangalore and toronto as well uh, but the intentions are great but we had to somehow uh, find ways to take full advantage of this partnership for the benefit of both uh, uh, canadians and indians we can we can uh, improve uh, both uh, uh, 
cultural relations and also strengthen and deepen the economic ties. There is a lot of potential. We only scratched on the surface. I, as I said, India with, uh, with their ambitions of uh, doubling and tripling their GDP and also infrastructure without infrastructure. I mean, infrastructure actually enables that growth and makes life better for the citizens of both uh, India and Canada. So uh, the, already we started that, but we need to take it to the next level. Given the geopolitical challenges with, with in Asia and particularly in South Asia, uh, the, we, we, we had to look at augmenting uh, the relations, most uh, trusting and uh, dependable, respectable relations between uh, Canada and India. Alberta will play its role, but other provincial governments and our federal government I think everyone will step up, but India also uh, make it easy for, particularly in our farm sector, because I was talking to Minister Mo, uh, Premier Mo, and also our own uh, agricultural uh, department and ministers uh, talked to me about uh, uh, about the certain challenges in, uh, because India definitely needs our, uh, our products, but, uh, and also uh, we are so grateful for Indo-Canadians for their contributions, uh, like uh, like Vipulji and everybody contributing in all sectors of uh, Canadian economy in every province. So we are so grateful and thankful for their contributions to make a better Canada, better Alberta. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, sir. So um, Rahul Ji, Rahul Agarwal, um, as you know, Minister Panda has expressed uh, a strong, keen interest in, uh, in joining hands uh, or MOUs between Invest Alberta and Invest India. So let us take that uh, process forward. And uh, so I'll just deliver my uh, 30 second closing remarks. Um, first of all, thank you to all the speakers for their very valuable insights and uh, sharing their experiences and those wonderful PowerPoint uh, presentations today. There's a lot of detail actually uh, in at least four or five presentations we saw today. Uh, this session video will now be edited and posted on the IMAC website uh, on all the social media platforms and it will be shared with all the speakers uh, as well. Uh, we hope you can also now join us later at the in-person roundtables. Uh, the fourth Make in India conference will now take place in a couple of months. So stay tuned for that. And before we go, let me once again thank all the IMAC sponsors uh, one final time. Uh, Efficience Canada, Skylink uh, Capital Corp, Pevy Binning, ICICA Bank Canada, SBI Canada Bank, One Place, Akal Insurance Brokers, Home Hotel and Resort, our presenting sponsor for 2022, Tangentia, and of course, the High Commission of India in Ottawa for their tremendous support and guidance in putting these events together. So thank you, everyone, once again. The session is now closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.